That's carried. Thank you very much, councillors. Uh, Rebecca, can you just please let me know when we're back into public? Live now. Thank you very much. And thank you to members of the public and to the press who have waited um, an hour past um, the app appointed time. And that was just due to a debate that went for an hour longer than it was expected to. So thank you for your patience on that. And um, thank you to councillors for that work just completed. This brings us to page 167 in the agenda. And this is submissions on the council's um, annual plan consultation document. The way that we're going to do this is, um, as I've said, it's a little bit trickier to receive reports. Um, I'm going to do it all in one go. Um, agrees to consider each of the submissions received and recommends the annual plan be amended. So um, unless there's any staff wishing to speak at the start of this, my plan is to essentially scroll through um, because we have heard from nine or ten um, submitters today, but there are others who we have to consider um, that we haven't um, heard from. Uh, Leanne, did you have anything to comment before we start rolling through these? No, I think once we get, once you've read through the submissions and we start to talk all things annual plan, I'd probably make a couple of points. Yeah, we're better the to come back. Report, better to come, okay. back to come back up to the top then and um, and start doing that um, rather than do it now and then go through the submissions. I agree. Perfect. Okay, so councillors, what I intend to do is just um, name each one and the page number as we get to it. Um, I'm not going to give. Um, uh, an overview of each of them, but please, this will be the one time on the uh, meeting where I think it would be good if people just, uh, if you want to speak to any of them, just speak rather than relying on me to see that you've typed up that you wish to. So our first uh, submitter you'll find on page 176, Stephen Phipps um, believes um, joining the LGFA is good and points out the coronavirus issues, um, which of course many submitters do. Um, keeping in mind that our um, coronavirus issues weren't issues, believe it or not, as recently as when we um, put the draft out. Mike Barra is the next um, submitter. Oh, sorry, did anyone have any comments on Stevens? No, thank you. Mike Barra is next. Um, comments on how much the rates have gone up um, over the last few years. I'll make comment. a comment and an observation because it goes, Neil, Steve. Uh, thank you, Neil because it goes forward is that it's interesting with some of the comments as an overview how I guess despite all the work that we're doing to try and help people understand how the rating system works and how things happen that that it still isn't getting through and I, I think a lot of the submissions to me um, speak a, a fair bit of that so I think it's something we need to keep on thinking about saying how can we do this better to try and help people to to actually grasp what we're trying to tell them it's not easy you know we, we struggle and we're doing it all the time type thing but um, just does, does, does concern me that we, and not, not saying Mike's in particular, but a number of submissions um, show that theme to me every time, and it's a bit of a shame. So we just need to keep on being mindful of finding ways of, of doing better so people actually understand what we're trying to do because, um, you know, a lot of people that are well informed just sometimes don't, aren't getting it. So we've got to try harder. And not just what we're, try what we're trying to do, but the confines, the legal confines that dictate what we can and can't do too. Linda Gray commented simply on um, a, a desperate need to join the LGFA. Uh, that was on page 179. I'm sorry, I'm working on a screen that's just being a little bit um, difficult here. Tracy Wood um, didn't actually um, put anything with the submission, but I did uh, talk to Tracy and she was all fine. She didn't want anything added to what's there. Glenn Callanan. Glenn regularly, um, he, he has supported um, the LGFA and um, Glenn regularly puts in um, very interesting and detailed uh, submissions as well as um, often correspondence as well. And I always enjoy hearing from Glenn. Any uh, any comments um, on, on that submission on page 181, councillors? No, I'll slowly progress on. Katie Milne has Oh, that's the Federated Farmers one, which I believe, um, well, we already heard from Federated Farmers today as well, very similar um, from um, David Cooper. Next, we're on page 
184 will see that letter. It was more a, um, a national one, which perhaps didn't quite take into account um, the situation that farmers find themselves here, um, as opposed to where they may be in some other parts of the country in terms of a rate reduction um, under the draft. Next, we have Judy Henderson, and Judy has also um, not actually recorded any comments here. I have tried to contact Judy, had no um, success. Tony Hammington um, agrees with the LGFA and has some um, comments to make on that. Kay Glanville similarly agrees with the LGFA scheme being um, joined. I think it was a significant majority of people um, agreed to the joining of the LGFA and Leanne will speak to that. Wendy Fitzgibbons um, agreeing to participate in the LGFA and discusses the effect of the proposed rates hike, which of course we're all working on today, um, not having that high at a 14% um, where it was at, um, but saying a body corporate um, misses out in some regards um, or, is, or is more highly rated perhaps than um, than a standalone unit. And our former councillor Barry Wills has submitted on page 190. Great to hear from Barry. Um, agrees with the LGFA and says that we must um, put rates in lockdown. Whilst um, continuing to do things such as deal with the three waters and other significant processes on track and reminds us all that whilst we face the pandemic, the probably biggest spectre, although less visible of climate change is still with us. David Walker agrees to participating in the LGFA and one of the many people who has said about how our capital value and, and the way that the split is done based on your prices um, leads to some imbalance or perceived inequity. Robin, Lalaveri, oh, does anybody know that name? I bet you I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, my apologies, Robin, if I, well, I'm almost sure I am. Robin um, wants to see rates come down. She says Tauranga City Council has decreased its proposed rates from 12% down to seven and believes she does the same. And she sits in the same, um, same. Um, oh, she's in a heritage, the Heritage Village, which I believe is the one that a previous person had, uh, is in um, and talks again about how um, with the body corporate, um, and I might just ask staff to take a note unless anybody's got something handy there, whether we've had any discussions with that body corporate. Um, these are the first times I've seen those come up. Your Worship. Thank yeah. you. Um, the, the thing about these ones is that it's just the way that our rating policy works. That means they have to pay for a water charge and a wastewater charge. Um, and I guess it's about the size of the house that you've built on your piece of land and then how you've then decided to either unit title or not. Um, and, and it's no different. I think if you go and look at the new lifestyle village in Cromwell, they've all been rated um, for the number of units they've got as well for the water charges. So it, it's when we when we turn around and um, change our, our water charging, it meant a benefit to these sort of people because they just paid the part of the connection and only for the water they use. So um, we've already been through this issue um, many years ago now when we destroyed three waters. So. Um, you know, otherwise you get the same services as anybody else living in a four bedroom house on their own. Well, I can I can comment directly on that because I used to live in one of those units and it's bigger than the standalone house that my son lives in now. So I don't see why it would necessarily have a lower, expect a lower cost for, for water or services like that. Yeah, but that's what they're looking for. That's what they're looking for. And I'm just yeah. trying to explain as to why that's not going to, well, why that doesn't happen and in my view shouldn't happen. Hmm. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Gary Campbell now on page 193 participate in the LGFA and um, mentions the, the rates rise um, and just to please do our best to um, keep those down. You know, one of many who have, who have made that comment is what we're endeavouring to do. Paul Keast um, does not want us to participate in the LGFA, uh, wishes us to be fiscally um, prudent and to avoid debt, even if that means delaying projects. Um, 
unfortunately, many of the projects that we're having to do, uh, we have to do without delay, according to the government. So we don't have a lot of choice in that. Um, and Paul has written at quite some length um, regarding the rates rise and saying, hey, everything has changed since you did this. Um, we've now got a recession slash depression. He doesn't use those words, but certainly talks about the effect on his business being a salad or um, the downturn in tourists and so forth. I say that as a camper van drives past outside, so maybe they're coming back. Andy Bartlett is on page 196, uh, participate in the LGFA scheme and um, has some comments there regarding um, rates. Andy's an employee at CODC, but that's neither here nor there. He's a rate power as well, I presume. Lana John um, agrees with joining the LF LGFA. If I've said it that many times today, I should be able to say it without hesitation. Thank you, Lana. David George um, agrees to joining the LGFA and um, raises the issue of the Cromwell Memorial Hall, um, wishing that it be um, progressed um, in, a, in a manner that he would like it to be, including a public meeting. One presumes that would be a town hall meeting and um, says that the CODC has failed to engage positively with the Cromwell Cultural Centre Trust. So. We each have our opinions on that. Thanks, David. Bill Dunbar agrees with joining the LGFA, says it's well overdue, and um, also raises the Cromwell Town Hall, um, states the Cromwell potable water is a disgrace and it's full of chlorine. Um, one of the things with chlorine is you only taste it when it's working, is my understanding. So I'm, I'm always pretty happy when I taste chlorine because it means I'm not getting hit by the bugs. And um, Bill also wishes to um, see rate decreases in light of COVID-19. Yes, I hear a voice. Shirley here. Hello, Shirley. <laughs> um, just with that, with the chlorine, it's a it's a message that we do need to get out there. And I know we've tried once, but we obviously keep needing to do that to let people know that exactly what you said, that you only ever taste chlorine if it's being used to kill bugs. So you won't taste the chlorine unless it's been activated by the germs. So I think, you know, we, we just need to keep putting that message out there. Yeah, absolutely agree. It was something I didn't know before I came and sat in the seat. And um, once you hear it, it changes your view entirely, doesn't it? And um, the other thing I guess for Bill is that um, under the stricter uh, water regulations, uh, there's going to be no choice. Um, other than having chlorine anyway. Thanks, Shirley. Billy Marsh um, is seems happy with the joining of the LGFA, but I believe wishes some of that to be um, applied to the ceiling of Mary Point Road. And um, Mary Point Road um, is one that at, is, at this stage, as my understanding, still hasn't received the, uh, it doesn't have the traffic to um, put it to a different position on the list. It is on the list, but um, doesn't have the traffic yet to get to the top. Bill Townsend. Um, That's why you wish it. Yes, Neil. Um, and um, it probably will be some time before it does for, for Ms Marsh's submission, but I guess what's worse is that, again, a perception that we've been deferring major roading projects mm. um, and, 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 you know, um, that, that our infrastructure is wanting because that's why we joined the LGFA. So it's a theme that's coming through as well, which is really disappointing because um, I'm, I'm yet to find out what all this infrastructure is that we haven't got, um, apart from probably sealing every um, gravelled road we've got, um, might be a, some, somebody would like to have happen. But again, just people get, you know, picking up that wrong end of the stick about what we're going to do with this money and, and um, you know, probably in a bit of a rude shock. And of course, what is uh, the, the magic number is a, a, a sealed road is about six times the maintenance cost of a gravel one as well. So it's not just the, the OPEX of putting it down, it's the, sorry, the CAPEX of putting it down, it's the OPEX of keeping it going once you've done it. So nothing's ever as simple as it seems. Thanks, Neil. Um, Bill Townsend, um, happy for us to join the old GFA, uh, but suggests we do that um, to spread the costs over the um, whole district. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. I'm, 
reading the wrong line there. Um, he's the 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 uh, what I'm wanting to read is that uh, he raises the point that there are a large number of retired superannuitants in the district, and a zero percent increase in rates be seriously considered for this financial year. And it's a for me it's a it's a dollar each way, isn't it? Because when people who are on fixed incomes have their property values go up and that causes an increase, not a proportionate increase, but an increase as it has this time around in rates, um, as opposed to areas that haven't, um, those people's income hasn't gone up. Um, having said that, the 23% of people in Central Otago who are over 65 have benefited from the increase uh, that the government put in at the start of the pandemic. So recognising what you're saying, Bill, um, it's none of this is easy. John Lister on page 202 um, points out that things are going to be very difficult after COVID um, and unwise to make hasty decisions um, until a clearer picture evolves. Isn't that the truth, John? Page, two, page 203 and Abernathy. Um, just getting myself to that. There's a, a quite a, a letter from Anne. Um, the uh, a lot of it on the point of the top ten and um, Cromwell, which is really out of um, council's control. Um, Neil, remind me, you were the chair of the board at the time. Um, in terms of top ten when it went on the market, was there any comment you wanted to make? Well, yeah, um, the board did try to purchase the camping ground along with some other people um, and the owner in the end decided that um, when they offered it for sale, then they decided that they wouldn't accept any offers and they decided then to do the development themselves. Um, so, um, yeah, we did and we weren't successful. Mm, so we tried. Thank you. Um, Greg Wilkinson, we heard from Greg today. That's on page 206 and had a good conversation with him. Gerald Downing on um, page 207 says LGFA is a good idea um, and he says um, that whilst rural ratepayers obtain the unders this time, I like his way of putting that, um, there's, there's other costs coming at the other end that are affecting the rural folk. Mel Hodge um, agrees to joining the LGFA and says we should have done it years ago. And um, then he has quite a bit to say about um, the cost of his rates, um, the cost of the water supply. Um, I think Malk is in Alexandra, so Malk, I'm hoping that the disgusting water um, in the not too distant future will be replaced by beautiful water from Clyde. Um, and, and has quite a bit to say on um, other matters as well. Thank you for that, Malk. Um, I guess the one the one comment I will make to um, Malk says that we should have already made the decision to cut the rates, and we live in a world that's um, totally controlled by statute, and um, we are making those decisions now at the earliest opportunity that we could within the confines that we've had. John Brimble, Sport Otago. Of course, we heard from. Um, Bill Godsell earlier on today, Claire Higginson, a former councillor on page 211, um, agrees with um, going with the LGFA and um, it, it writes um, at some depth about rate costs and um, the effect of COVID-19 and the donut economy. And I would I really encourage people to um, jump on TED Talk, YouTube, uh, Kate Railworth, the donut economic model. Um, it would be brilliant to see that operate in all sectors of our society. But um, it's a theory at the moment, other than I think Amsterdam is the one city in the world that has um, run its budget on that. And um, talks also clear talks on um, the Clyde upgrade and so forth. Thank you, Claire. Tony Banks on page 213 um, agreeing with the LGFA. Um, and talks of, of the costs um, and finding ways of bringing the rates down. Again, a very common theme. Scott Sinclair agrees with the LGFA 
and um, says keep the rate increase to a minimum, but balance that with ensuring that essential services are maintained very much at the forefront of our mind. Thank you, Scott. Gray Shatke um, agrees to participating in the LGFA and um, questions the the equitable equitability of um, rating properties on a capital basis. Um, and again, like so many other people in their submissions concerned about how we're going to track our way through the post COVID world when so much remains unclear at the moment. Matthew Sol, we heard from Matthew today. He was our first submitter. Um, and Gavin Dan is our next um, submission on page 218, agrees with the LGFA and talks about the, uh, Gavin's very big on, on our fresh water um, and agrees uh, and, and says about the problems that we've got, um, including lake snow that he identifies and um, concerns about Alex being able to take on the Clyde wastewater, which um, we've had assured that it can do, uh, particularly once it's upgraded and um, supports the easing of the rates on our productive sector. And um, no doubt council will have to visit this area, especially for those rural, uh, sorry, urban folk who are ratepayers and have had lo lost jobs and had income slashed. Good luck with that. Thank you, Gavin. I appreciate that sentiment. Colin Faulkner, we heard from to this morning. His, his submission on page 20 that he spoke to. Vicky West on page 221 goes with the LGFA and um, recognises that, hey, things are going to get pretty tough for young people uh, and uh, younger families and the elderly. And um, let's just do what we can to make sure our families and businesses survive. Thank you. David Ross on page 222 agrees to participate in the LGFA and um, would like to see the Regional identity budget cut, half the money, half of all money spent on advertising is wasted. The problem is knowing which half, and that's the secret to um, advertising, I guess. Lynn Stewart, a regular submitter, thank you, Lynn, um, agrees to the LGFA, but not as a guaranteeing local authority. And um, says the rate changes are fair. Thank you, Lynn. Jenny and Wynne Morris um, agree to the um, LGFA and um, yes, says it's difficult to make comments on the proposed changes due to the current pandem pandemic, but recognises the need to keep ahead of the infrastructure must be maintained. So thank you for recognising uh, the problems that we have to deal with. Nigel Murray um, does not want us to um, participate in the LGFA uh, scheme. Um, we would be better off retaining a debt-free status um, and um, major council expenditures are not equally shared by urban and rural and the rural sector is propping up the rest. Um, quite, there's quite a bit to say there and I'm sure councillors will have read that. And in terms of the rate changes, um, concerned about the cost of it, that we're not discouraging waste. I think we are, we're just not successfully doing it because people keep um, consuming, uh, throwing out a lot of stuff. We're not doing it as successfully as we intend to. I wondered, I, I actually can remember highlighting this before all my highlights disappeared. Water consumption in this district is more than double the national average per person. That came as a surprise to me. Is there anyone who wants to comment on that? Uh, I'd be happy to, Tim. Uh, uh, Chair of Three Waters, as you should, yes. <laughs> Julia is provided a graph um, on water usage across 42 local authorities that uh, participated in the survey and it shows that water use residential water usage in CODC it sits at slightly under the national average of those 42 authorities. So I don't know where Mr Murray got his information from but Based, based on the information from from uh, Water New Zealand in this graph, he's wrong. And I think it needs to be noted in saying that too, that we're under the um, national average whilst living in the driest part of the country, which for me, and that's why I question that, because um, I'm continually in front of other mayors loudly extorting the values of volumetric charging and how if we don't value our water, people will waste it. And the fact that we are, punching above our weight on the average, far less taking into account our dryness, shows the importance of valuing um, 
our asset, our water asset. So and thank you for that. And maybe just a, the the reference if somebody is writing back to Mr Murray is that is Water New Zealand National Benchmarking Report and the figures that are being quoted for the year 2019. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful because it's very easy for um, anecdotes like that to um, suddenly go from fiction to fact if enough people um, say them. So it's good to have that clarified. Thank you, Nigel. Page 227, we have um, Stu Millis um, submitting on behalf of Alexandra Clyden District Business Group, and they submit on a number of things. The Lifestyle Retirement Village, um, that um, would have been discussed at the Vincent Community Board, I'm sure. I wasn't able to make that meeting. Um, community involvement and in projects, absolutely. And there's been some great work done on the um, river track that the, uh, that the um, business group has led. I uh, would like to see another track go up the other side. Sounds like a great idea. Um, some zoning issues which don't come into the annual plan. Tidiness of the verges. I don't know how you get to take uh, for people, get people to take more pride in their properties, but if they've got any ideas, I'd love to hear them. And yeah, the trees down lower Tarbot Street. Totally agree. They block a view of the river that would be great to have. Um, Ratepayers need to be kept up to date with what's happening in water and sewage. I don't know, I've, I've thought it was, it's been really good, particularly when the pipeline was getting put in the um, rail trail. Perhaps it was just because I lived in Clyde, I saw more of it. I certainly saw quite a bit. Now they note that the industrial park's growing well. Um, they like the fact we've had increased population, but retail businesses are struggling. And I suspect um, reading this, that this was all written pre-COVID. So, um, Things have changed a bit there too. Um, yes, we re recognise the district plan that's being worked on. And of course, the Alexander and Clyde spatial plan being worked on as we speak. Development of a dry gully into a park or a, a boat harbour. Cool. Um, again, not annual plan stuff. Um, keep the airport ticking over. And um, part 12, we must give credit for the CODC for helping with various projects in our area. And many of our members have praised the council for help they've received. And we often hear from other business people that the CODC is better to deal with than other councils. The CODC needs to know that their great work is appreciated. So thank you very much, um, Stu and the business group. It's ni nice to have such a positive um, letter from you and, um, and agree with the proposal to join the LGFA. Gillian Sullivan, on the other hand, does not want us to join the um, council, join the LGFA, um, recognising that uh, this is um, tied in with growth and that we are doing things that the growth is forcing us to do and um, doesn't wish for growth to happen there. Um, we can learn from Queenstown's position where we've had untrammeled growth and unfettered tourism. Wow, that's a lesson learned there too, isn't there? Um, and a support only rate increase that Gillian would support would be to go towards environmental service costs. Um, so thank you for that, Gillian. Roderick and Mary Ann Baxter, we heard from Mary Ann um, today with a very full submission and in, in the variable submissions earlier on today. Thank you for that. And Jeremy Baker from the Cozy Homes Charitable Trust, we also heard from, and uh, they've given a very full submission uh, there. So I'm just working my way through. Uh, next, we have 239 Bridget Winter from the Molyneux uh, Turf Incorporated, and they um, agree with um, entering into the LGFA and would like to see some of that money used to enable um, the sports turf in Alexandra to go ahead. David Cooper from Federated Farmers, uh, we heard from today. Gay Gardner, we're now on page 247, councillors. Um, and um, agrees to participating in the LGFA and um, has that challenge that we're all facing with um, why is it based, why is a portion of the rates based on the land value? Um, simply put, that's uh, what the law says has to be done, it's the proportion that counts and we can't take into account what the property values may have become, what may have happened to property values since the pandemic, we can only go with what uh, QV has put to us last year. Anna Robinson, member of the Vincent Community Board, lovely to hear from Anna on page 248, participate in LGFA and um, the rates changes quite rightly notices that um, COVID-19 has hit us and something needs to be done to take that into account. Craig Gilchrist, 249, agrees to the LGFA because it will spread cost over um, multiple generations. 
uh, doesn't have any comments on the rates. Jill Wolf from well, she and made uh, quite clear she was doing this on her own bat, but as um, she is the chair of Naseby Vision, a great deal of that did uh, focus very much on the treasure of the money of Toto. Uh, Mike Riddell um, does not want participation in the LGFA scheme, um, but similar to um, to Gillian earlier on. Um, sees this as being related to growth and growth not necessarily being something that we should be seeking. Um, it's something that's um, hard to avoid though in a place like Central Otago, whether you're seeking it or not, um, would be my comment to that. Brian Turner, uh, former poet laureate, um, not to participate in the LGFA and um, again notices the uh, the changes that he's seen in his 76 years of living in Otago um, and relates a lot of those back to, um, I think it could be best summarised as greed perhaps, and sees that um, the LGFA funding will only increase the ability to uh, move in that direction. Evelyn Skinner has um, put a very detailed and well thought through submission, not supporting the um, LGFA and noting um, the effects of um, COVID-19, the post-COVID-19 post world, which realistically um, we still don't have a very good grip. Nobody does on what it's going to look like. Um, and yes, a very detailed, um, I'm just making sure that I was right then, that she did say that she did or didn't agree with that. Bear with me. Uh, I'm not too sure whether I was right in saying she disagreed now that I've reread it. And again, I just apologise. I did have notes with all of these, but um, they disappeared off my computer, which was incredibly helpful when I found that out this morning. So I'm a, I'm a bit unclear there. I think she perhaps was agreeing with some fairly strong caveats um, and included a letter from Climate Change Commission. Jerry Eckhoff we heard this morning. We're on page 266, councillors. Robin Piper from the Central Otago Wild and Conifer Control Group um, submitting, seeking confirmation of the continuation of the grant from council. Um, and that will be addressed later on in the day. Um, <coughs> And that's that. Great, because I don't know about you, but I'm really tired of hearing my voice. Um, so Leanne, I'm going to take us back to uh, page 167, because you had some comments you wanted to make. Cool, thank you. Hopefully this is the last you hear of me for today too. Um, I'm going to obviously take the paper as read. Um, just a reminder that we started this process some time back at an average rates increase of 4.9. Um, and obviously we proposed to join the LGFA um, to have the ability to fund our capital projects across the generations. We know that COVID-19 hit and we know that we've tried hard as a collective team to see how we can get an average zero rates increase should that be the way forward. Um, in both my presentation this morning and um, Sanchez, we talked about you know, our positive balance sheet and maximising our opportunities. And I guess my advice is that we think very, very carefully about using those reserves and how we use those reserves, um, acknowledging that they are here for a rainy day, no, no arguments there, but also being conscientious of that our wave and that's the bit that I'm quite concerned about how that looks in 12 months time. So the other thing I just really wanted to clarify was on page 169 we talk about the adjustments and um, Tim I know this came up in your um, message to me earlier in the week. Um, we talked about savings of 2.15 million but when you when we talk, sorry, we talk about 1.78 um, reduction, but when you add up our actual savings, it comes to 2.15, which is actually correct. And that it 
It doesn't allow for the adjustments we made at the consultation as we're leading into the consultation, and it also doesn't allow for the fact that we had allowed for needing to readjust the interest expense because we won't get the revenue. So when you go to page yeah. 170, straight away you see 196.550 of interest expense, what's well, actually reduced income, rates income, because we're using reserves and we're not getting the rates income in. So that adjusts everything back down and takes away some of those 2.15 million of savings, resulting in a reduction overall of 1.78. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leanne. Cool. Um, other than that, the only other thing I would talk about, and I'm just having fun with my mouse, is the um, when you look at where we've recommended, where finance and management have rec recommended changes to try and get us through to this um, average rate increase of nil, give or take. We've we've mentioned reserve funding, carry forwards, changing. Um, how we allocate costs, um, postponing some work, and different actions there create bow waves, but not all create bow waves. So I'm not sure if you want me to talk through that. I think that would be good. Thank you. Okay. So carry forwards. The beauty of carry forwards is that we're using um, Revenue that we rated for this year into next year. So we haven't spent it this year. So we're proposing where there's savings, let's take them forward and mitigate some of the costs next year to help keep our rates down. And that's what we've recommended with the um, Molyneux and Cromwell pool costs as carry forwards. The reality is there still will be a bow wave because those costs will still be there in the following year. But it is a, a viable way of doing it. The three lots of water, wastewater and waste minimisation costs come to a million. And that was the piece of work that we, we met when we talked with the exec committee. This is the big cost and we thought if we reserve funded it, and again, we were working on the fly at that stage. It was very early in the piece with not a lot of time to plan. We thought that could be a good way of mitigating costs. And it is in that we give relief in this 2020-21 financial year, but those costs will compound into the following year. So it's just masking the problem. The LTP consultation costs is very simple and it was something I was planning to bring forward into the LTP thinking anyway. It is for costs that, that have a, a peak every three years. So the most sensible way forward is to reallocate those costs over the three years and you rate for it every a third each year. And the other one's quite handy to do that with is, which has been done in the past, is the triennial costs, so that you're not doing the peaks and troughs with the rates, it's trying to smooth it out. And that's quite legitimate. Detailed seismic assessment was suggested to be postponed a year. Um, the disaster relief fund, we proposed delaying, putting any funds in this year, this coming year, and the same with the emergency work reserves. So both, um, don't cause so much as a bow wave next year, although because they've missed this year, you again get that that impact that they weren't. There will be 226k of costs next year that you didn't get rated for in the in the proposed annual plan. Grants budget we proposed initially we we talked about trying to reduce it by 50%. We were not able to do that because a lot of our grants currently are already pre-allocated through the long term plan, so they're not actually contestable. We identified approximately 24% that could be reduced and we've since identified that we didn't quite get that right either. There was two we had in there that have to be allocated. One was for us this pool and one was for Wilding Pines. So that's where we got to um, when we met with the exec committee. And as I said, that was quite early on. And since then, we've done a lot of work um, talking to other councils, going to webinars, um, sitting through the annual plan that um, webinar that Solgan put on, which was um, another really good, I found really useful one to listen to, to know what we could and couldn't do. Um, and I guess now we're in your hands to how you'd like us to, where you'd like us to go from here. 
Thanks very much, Leanne. Well, the first thing will be obviously councillors will have questions and Lindley, you'll put your hand up first. Thanks, Leanne. It's Lindley here. I just um, some of the carry forwards like for the polls. Can I just clarify um, there are a result of pool closures, so they actually savings. Do they still need to be carried forward? I'll just clarify they're not completely as a result of pools. They are actually as a result because these costs were actually around people and it's the fact that we are underspent in our personnel costs collectively this year. So it's a mix. So it's only the balance that's a carry forward rather than the underspend that wasn't required because of closures. Correct. It's 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 the fact that we haven't needed it all in this current year, so I propose to carry it forward. Okay. And normally, normally we bring our carry forwards to council in about August each year. Thank you for that. Thank you, Lindley. Other councillors, do you have questions for Leanne? OK, well, Leanne, I think the uh, before I thank you and your staff for what you've done, because it's been um, a very difficult time and I know because I've sat in a few um, meetings with you um, to try to get to these points, but I just think the highlight figure for people to take away is uh, well, probably a very important, a number of very important points. Firstly, we've gone from that 4.99 um, figure of an average rates increase down to 1.8 and that's um, a significant amount. That does take into account um, growth in the district. So um, the, then the average rating increase decreases to actually below zero, which is quite remarkable. But I think it's crucially important that um, members of the public and, and members of the media that are listening recognise that that's the average rating unit decrease. So the income that we anticipated having from last year to this year um, is, is changing by that amount, not by the previous amount. That doesn't mean that everyone's rates are changing in the same manner and there's a number of factors in that. Paramount in that is the difference between capital value increase and land value increase between primarily our urbans and our um, rurals. We looked at whether we could even have a conversation about that and the answer outside of an LTP year is no, we couldn't. So. Um, there will be, when we come back in June, um, a clearer picture of what it means for the individual towns, the commercial people in the individual towns, the residential in the individual towns, and the farms, although um, I wouldn't anticipate that this will change the position for the farms greatly. Um, but at this stage, it's really important that we are upfront in saying that this does not mean everyone will be getting a 0% rates rise. Am I correct in saying that? That is correct, and and I did have a look at the sample. Uh, um, have a sort of not. A, I haven't got a sample rate pass as such, but to try and get a feel for percentages because I was asked that earlier today. But it's it's quite hard to gauge. I can look at a five percent. Um, I can look at a five percent, and it's eighty nine dollars, and I can look at a five percent increase, and it's and it's it's nearly two hundred dollars. So it always depends. My only concern with this proposal and I accept that we've achieved basically a 0% increase. My concern is that we have created a significant bow wave for next year. What's your recommendation in that regard then, Leanne? My recommendation would be that we aim for a slightly less of a rates decrease, that we we recognise there might be some savings later in the um, as we work through the COVID-19 impacts. That we rather than we rather than reserve fund the million dollars, we simply reserve fund the grants budget that's that we haven't um, that we've rated for at the moment. So do a bit of a swap, which is a half a million dollar difference. But what that does is mitigate the bow wave and it gives the community the opportunity to consult on our level of grants, whereas we next year in the LTP, whereas we can't consult on the costs of 
waste water, waste minimisation and our three waters. So it's giving a little bit of an opportunity back. And I guess if I was playing with my little model that I have here, I, it would change things and mitigate a lot of the bow wave, but the average rates increase would become a 1.1%. That's accounting for growth? That's accounting for growth. And recognising that inflation in itself is around 1.7 to probably closer to 2% by the end of this year, 1.1 is still a reasonable figure. And it takes away some of the hurt in the new financial year, the new well, year when you go to LTP. It puts us below, it puts an average rates increase across the district below the rate of inflation. So the uh, rate of inflation is something that you, you, it has to be a, um, a figure that can be, be looked at as a bit of a um, staging point in, in thinking. We're still underneath that even if we haven't achieved the zero, but what, and councillors have talked earlier on today about being concerned about doing things that will mean next year, when particularly with, um, um, we don't know what's going to happen between now and then, and particularly with potential that things will be worse then than they are now, um, with who knows how you know, wage subsidies and so forth will continue. Um, we don't want to be setting our community up for uh, by saving something now to uh, have a bigger problem with those costs that we can't control, such as water and wastewater and so forth next time. Okay. Um, can I just ask, I'm going to ask councillors for further questions, um, but the, the reduced grants, are there any of those that um, are already allocated that organisations will suddenly go, oh, hang on a minute, we thought we were getting that, what's happening? Are there anything, is there anything there, um, is, there is there any more detail available on those grants? Jotham, are you there? Have you got the detail behind all our grants? I know we, we had inadvertently removed Wilding Pines and we've built that back in. That's back in Since, there, is it? Correct. And we had missed one from from Teviot Valley, which was a grant that, that maintained the pool, and yes. we've put that back. Um, they were the two that we had um, not realised were basically in they were perhaps should never have been in a contestable yeah. grant pot anyway, though, because they've been there yeah. um, for such a long time. OK, yeah. so in terms of that, so one these are things we, sorry. sorry, carry on, Leanne. These are things that we will look at in a different way when we do the long term plan so that um, grants that are actually contestable are grants and funds that are actually for basically operational every year need to be separated out as not being a grant in the true sense. Okay. Jotham here, just to add to the um, grants discussion, the grants we were able to remove were the grants that are contestable and these sit under promotional or general grants. Mm -hmm. Any grant that was specific to a community or a group, we left it in there. So the grants we took out were the promotional grants, uh, the general grants and the Anzac Day Observance Grant because that hadn't been used for the past three years in all the um, community boards, so we removed that. Yeah. And if I recall, Jotham, some of that we've carried forward because we didn't allocate all the funds in this current year. Yes, there is potential to carry some of that money forward, and that's something we could do. I think one of the things that, and councillors, I'd, I'd love to hear from people, one of the things that we um, have achieved here is recognising whilst, whilst a lot of submitters asked for a 0% rise, um, an awful lot also said, please take into account what COVID has done. I think there's probably more said, please take into account what COVID has done than actually put a figure on it. Um, and we've done that. Um, under under your recommendations um, to have a to have an average rates increase that's less than the rate of inflation um, has done that, particularly compared to 4.99. Mm. Um, 
Neil, um, Neil's wanting, right, let's let's look at councillors here. What have we got? Um, Neil, you had a question about the Anzac Day budget. Yep. Um, sorry, Jotham just mentioned about something hadn't been used for Anzac Day in certain years. I'm sure it's not a lot of money, but um, I'd be surprised as usually been the normal swarm of reefs and those sort of things. So um, news to me. Yeah, so, so the end, it is less than a thousand for all the community boards and it hasn't been used in the last three years. No, so the reefs, so. Must, be, the reef, the reefs must have been getting funded from somewhere. It might have been funded from somewhere else, but not in the Anzac Day observance. I can't, right. but I can double check that. Yep. Well, the last thing we want is someone says, oh, you can't have your wreaths this year because there's no budget anymore. That'll be interesting. I'm sure it won't happen. <laughs> They could be reaching in our pockets. <laughs> Those reasons be going there, all right. Stu, you had a question. Uh, the wild and pine thing. Can I just take that that it's still in that contestable fund or not? It is. It's Leanne here. Sorry, okay. it is still in the contestable fund. We've added that back in. Because the only thing is, it would actually, when you look at it on the outside, with the government giving its money to environmental services and that it may be one that's picked up by regional or central government, like in regional council, and a tree will only grow bugger all in the next two or three years and what we're saying, man, a chemical or chainsaw to cut it down, so it could be one that could come out. Um, it's surely here. Stu, just to clarify, um, Otago missed out. So um, central government with wild and conifer control only went as far as Canterbury going south and if you miss a year, that is more than just one year's growth. It doesn't quite work like that. And I'm sure Phil Murray would be able to explain that to you better than I can. But it's really important to continue with the momentum. So I'd be very reluctant to see that come out. Yeah, but take it that there's been nothing done for 25 years and we've only had three or four years of doing it. Missing a year or something like that when we're in a disaster. Those, those three years, um, the, particularly the group, um, the local group have been extremely successful in, in what they've done and you would go backwards a big time if you missed out a year. I think for me, Stu, Walding Pines is something that an awful lot of people in Central Otago are concerned about, me included, and it would be whilst we might be able to say, well, the government's putting in more money and thank you for your comment, Shirley, that's very helpful. Um, there is still a responsibility and is it 20,000 off the top of my head? Is that what we're putting in this, Jotham? Jotham, yeah, correct. Yeah, it, it, it probably shows um, the community's um, investment in it so that it would be a bit hard to go to government, which I intend to, having heard that it didn't come south of Canterbury. I wasn't aware of that to say why the hell not um, if we're not put, willing to put some in ourselves. Martin, did you have a question? Um, a, just a, a comment and a question. I can I can live with the 1.1%. Um, I'd be interested to know how that does have an effect on individual ratepayers because Simpson Residential was facing up to 14% under the old um, allocations. And of course, I think you have to acknowledge that we do run a bit of a risk of precedent because our ratepayers, when they look at this, bringing this in underneath um, the rate of inflation for the 2020-21 year, uh, the question could well be put to us in the future, well, you did it once, why can't you do it again? Probably have to explain that at the time. But yeah, it's it's always the risk. And, Tracy, and I, sorry. Sorry, I, I do acknowledge that, but I think all councils are operating and in a very unusual time and doing everything they can to make this work. Um, as I put in my message, often we do these unused funds tend to hit our reserves and then we can use them for a rainy day. This year we're planning our rainy day in advance, so to speak. We recognise where we're at and what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Tracy. Yeah, um, I this bow wave thing, uh, really does concern me uh, from a personal perspective. When we last had a rates increase, we had a 37% rates increase. 
Now, the uh, as I said earlier today, the ups and the downs is just, um, it's actually, it's really hard on people to try and to get to grips to that. So I, I don't know, I, I do share Leanne's concern about that and I have concerns that people go, and yes, farmers will get the benefit of the unders this year, this time round, but then potentially farmers won't get the benefit of the overs the next time round again. Um, and we don't want our urban counterfolk to have the same thing happen. If, so I just I'll leave it at that. But the other thing about the wild and kinds, um, as far as the there has been a lot of um, work done. So I fully support surely that things um, do need to keep moving on that front. I uh, I think that the Wilding Pines issue is quite significant. So Tim, I'd be happy if you'd follow that up, please, from government side of things. And I've always been very supportive of what we've received um, funding and things in the past. Farmers have in in relation to you know put our own funds in, and that type of th that type of you know working together is definitely the way forward to fix that problem. So. I'd like to see that continue. Thanks, Tracy. Neil, you had a comment on the bow wave. Yeah, I think a couple of things, and one first bit in relation to Tracy's comment about um, what's happened in the rural side of things before with with, with rating changes. Um, two things that that, that again, the, there's always that valuation one, but the other one that we did uh, last time as part of the LTP was to try and bring the playing field for rural um, ratepayers across the district to something a bit more level. Um, and a bit like we, we've done in the past with the urban areas as well. We've now got pretty well all the urban areas with the same services, generally paying the same sort of rates, whether you live in Maniatoto or Alexander or Cromwell or, or, or Roxburgh. So that was um, what, what did hit the rural people last time to make that correction out in the Maniatoto and the Maniherakia in particular. Um, but the, the big thing about big, op big opportunity and the advantage we've got with the Bow Wave for next year is we are going into an LTP year. So we get a chance to go and not just do an annual plan on year four. We get to basically redo years one to uh, well years four to ten of the current LTP plus years um, the three years that follow that. So we get a good opportunity to address that bow wave um, better than we would otherwise normally be able to do in, the, in an annual plan process. So that gives me some 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 faith and some confidence that that we get a chance to really look closely at that that bow wave for um, FY22. So. Um, and if we didn't have that, then I think I'd be a lot more concerned than 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 what I otherwise am. Thank you, Leanne. You wish to speak on the reserves? Yes. So if we just go back to the bow wave, we've just removed a million and swapped it with five hundred and fifteen, which is the grants. If you think back to the paper that we talked about with um, the disaster relief fund, the um, using the reserve the emergency reserve fund to fund that 500 and 11 672 that's the bit we've rated at the moment in the balance of of grants that was where i was heading in the earlier paper because the grants go across they come out of all four districts so therefore at least using that disaster recovery reserve the interest only for that 511672 is more equitable to our rate pairs than the original plan of the million dollars. And that 511 um, is is just over half of that um, emergency reserve fund. The other 400,000 um, I believe would be sitting in there for a later date after what we discussed earlier. Correct. But that 511 would that still be targeted um, at the water services wastewater and waste minimisation as discussed? No, that's because we've just taken. So that was what I was proposing that we take the million and we rate the million, but instead we use 511,672 to offset the grants, which we can then consult on next year in the long term plan. You're helping mitigate the bow wave. Right. Alternatively, so, alternatively, we rate for the grants, but only reserve fund half a million. It's just where are you going to reserve fund it from? We'd be much better off, I would think, to reserve fund it from a, a, a rainy day fund or indeed an emergency fund 
than we would from general because if it's if it's not raining outside, it's bucketing down. So it's time to use that, some of that money, I would suggest. Um, Nigel, a comment from you. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, I, I, I would support the position as Leanne has just outlined it of um, swapping around grants and the reserve funding from the essential services and using the disaster relief fund um, in the manner as she outlined to achieve a 1.1 percent average rate rise. That makes sense to me. Nigel? Um, there's some other councillors I haven't really heard from on this one. Ian, what, what are your thoughts, please? Ian, you might still be on mute. Sorry, I was having a few problems. Um, yeah, I agree with Nigel there, really. I think that's, um, that's the way to go. OK, thank you. Tamer, what's your thoughts? I agree with Nigel as well. Um, I think can almost hear, hear you. Yeah, I agree with Nigel as well. I think it is appropriate to use some of that disaster relief interest money um, to offset that, but agree with Leanne around the bow wave and, um, you know, sort of short term gains now that then everybody pays for in 12 months time. So I think that is a good middle road. Thank you. How about you, Cheryl? What are your thoughts? Uh, yes, I um, also agree with Nigel um, and Leanne, but having said that, I, we, I also am concerned that we simply don't know uh, what a 1.1 average rate increase looks like in our area. So we still don't know until we see that. It's very difficult to be happy about it. I mean, obviously it's 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 better than it was. Um, and that I, I, I'm very grateful to, to the staff for having done as much work as they have to have got it to the stage that it is. Um, but yes, I would, I would dearly like to know what it does look like across the, um, in each of the areas. Leanne, I might just get you, um, particularly for the benefit of folk who are listening in and media to explain why it is you can't push a button on a machine and tell us what it all means um, within five minutes, because it would be lovely if you could. Oh, I would love to be able to do that. I truly would. The reality is we have to now go back and change individual budgets, and that's multiple lines, and then we run that finance model, which takes about four hours to, to run, so it'll run overnight because it slows our system down significantly. And then we load that into a rating model which has every single property in it. So all 14,000 odd properties. And that takes another piece of time. That I think that's a better part of four hours as well. And then we have to extract that into, which comes out quite gobbledygook, and turn that into a rating model to be able to demonstrate that to you. So it would be at least the end of this week before we were at that stage. And then we've got to get all of that data into the book, the annual plan, the book, and have that ready for everybody by the end of next week in time for adoption of the 3rd of June. So extremely tight, tight timelines. Um, happy to do whatever you'd like us to do to try and make that easier, but don't have the answers instantly um, to do that. So what would you like? How would you like to, I guess, proceed from here? I think the reality, um, Leanne, is that we have to work on a principled um, way forward and, and we've done that with the broader scope of saying, well, we know it's going to be a 1.1% increase, which is a hell of a lot better than a 4.9. Um, we see, we, we, we don't, we can't get then get you to put that into the machine and have the machine come out with the result and time to have another meeting to get it in by our legislative timelines. So we have to work on our best oh. principles. Um, the outcome of that will be, if nothing else, significantly better than where we were um, in, in, you know, two months ago or three months ago. Um, and, um, and then 
from you know we'll probably give you about 10 minutes off and then we can start working towards the LTP and start doing <laughs> some of the some of the more detailed work within the um, within the the rules that apply to us um, that we can make some changes during the LTP this is very much and as I think Jerry Yukov called it it's a housekeeping budget year two of the LTP but this is a, a that probably never will be as big a year two um, again uh, but year three being the LTP year is the year we can really do things. Yeah. Um, I can't see any other way around it and, and I know that members of the public will probably think well that's ridiculous you should be able to sit here with a slide rule and work out um, what it all means but you, you said a number there which is relevant 14,000 um, rateable units you've got to work mm. work it into how it sits with all of those some are developed some are undeveloped some are commercial it's it's not easy and it's only once you um, get into actually working within local government either as staff or governance that you've realized just how big the machine is and, and how hard it is to be nimble with it. Um, Lindley, I haven't heard from you. Oh, look, I'd like to thank um, the staff for all the work that they've done on this and, and thank Leanne for, although we want to bring the rates down as, as low as we possibly can, um, erring on the side of caution regarding the bow wave um, that will come to us in the future. Now, I agree with what she said and I'm, I think the 1.1 is a good um, outcome. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to take us back to page um, 167. I'm not going to do anything much more than just say, Leanne, at this stage, um, because um, I'm very shortly going to move those and ask my Deputy Mayor to um, second them, but I'll just check there's no further questions or comments from Neil before I do that. But Leanne, just to, we're safe to do that and then go back to the disaster recovery reserves and complete that paper or do you want us to jump backwards and then come back here or what's what's the proper I, I can't see a problem either way unless I miss something nor can I I think you should be able to now adopt accept these recommendations and then go back to your other paper quite comfortably great thank because you because they go hand in hand right um Stu I see you've jumped in for a comment and then I'm going to come to you Neil yeah just that disaster relief um, we hope, heavens forbid, we don't have a major uh, flood, snow warning, take out a whole lot of infrastructure of our own or an earthquake. So it's good that it's there, but it's there for a reason as well. So we just got to keep that in the back of our mind as well. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because the, very much so, we could have another disaster, but um, whatever the disaster is, if we'd had an earthquake and we use that disaster relief fund, well, it's what it's there for. And we just got to hope like hell um, it doesn't come back. Right. Neil, did you have as Deputy Mayor any for, um, final wrap ups? Comments? Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, I think firstly that when we come to the resolution moving department that C needs to have um, what those decisions actually are written up to go in there. So hopefully someone's been doing that in the background. Otherwise, um, I don't know what it is that you'll be moving and I'll be seconding. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if, if we've got our backs against the wall because of a 3rd of June deadline date because uh, annual plan adoption, I would have thought by 30 June, um, have we given ourselves too short a time frame than we need? And I couldn't see any harm um, because it, given the time that Leanne said to run these models and, and any other opportunities that still exist that we haven't actually um, landed on yet for further savings are still there. So. Um, I hate to think that we've got our backs up against the wall to a 3rd of June date when we can actually extend that meeting time or have a special meeting to do it because it's not the first time we've all done that. Um, and then we can you know, make sure we get all of these I's dotted, T's crossed, get the numbers crunched and know exactly what it is the impacts are of our decision. Um, because otherwise, because when it comes to us, it's ready for adoption. So, um, and I'd have no qualms and in, in something coming to us and saying, oh, we've done these numbers, done what you said to do, and we also found this and have, um, you know, as an option, if you like, um, rather than, than find ourselves working to a, to a 3rd of June date, because it seems incredibly early from my experience. So I'd be interested to know if we can just change that. Just lost you there, Neil. Yeah. You there? There you are, Neil? can hear yeah. now. You got to rather than and then you stopped. Oh, did I? I didn't stop, I got to yeah. draw you. Oh. Well, pick it up from rather Neil, than. It might have been you. Oh, OK, I hope my headphones aren't going flat. Apologies. OK, well, let me um, ask Leanne um, the two questions and maybe Sanchia, I'm not sure. Let's deal firstly with the can do you need more time and can we give it to you? Leanne Sanchia, do we need to be as rushed as we are? 
Um, I, from, from where I sit, no, we don't. Um, Neil is quite correct. We have to the 30th of June. Um, when I looked at the calendar, I don't think we had, didn't think we had at the time another um, meeting in June. I thought it wasn't till July for some reason, early July. I guess the other part of this is, is by having this component done, and I guess it's a practice I come from, I tend to have come from a history of always trying to get the annual plan adopted in May, um, means that June, it gives a particular chunk of the organisation time to start getting ready for the annual report, which is another significant piece of work. And also many of our staff are already working on the long term plan. On top of that, from a purely from a selfish point of view, I lose my finance manager for the better part of June while he's on parental leave. How dare he? I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Leanne, if, uh, uh, unless Antia has a differing view, uh, do, do you wish to change that date or are you comfortable where it's at? From where I sit, I'm comfortable, but I'm hearing what council is saying. They don't know what the sample rate payers looks like. So are we anticipating that you would go away with these figures now? and come back to us with another draft that we would then have the opportunity to have another go at. We would need to set another council meeting. We still will be running tight by that stage because if we come back on the 3rd of June, we've still got to finalise what if you if again start the budget again, possibly if, if it's not what you want, but again, it's council decision. We'll still have an annual plan book to get done and we will be running very close to 30 June timeline. So we're in, um, yes, Sanchia, comment please. I think, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I don't disagree with anything Leanne said. I would just make uh, two comments, uh, one, is that we might want to just ask Rebecca in on the schedule of other political meetings, noting that 30 June is a uh, Cromwell Community Board, we're into a series of those uh, by then, so it's pushing it very late to leave it to them. Uh, and the other is if we were going to have a schedule a special meeting, uh, but we still have the 3rd of June one, it is a considerable amount of work for staff even bringing reports through each time, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, one thing I'm considering is if we were to, uh, you know, here's me being the eternal optimist, if we were between now and say the 3rd of June to find some other way of savings, how would they be reflected in this? I know you've, you've looked very hard, but how would how would other savings um, be reflected? Is, is that part of why, coming back to Neil's two part question, C is moderately vague at the moment. Is that to enable that? Uh, Leanne here again, that was never my intention. The, the reason it was vague at the time was to allow for, for a debate today on how you wanted us to proceed forward. Um, right. So in that I'm case. Happy, happy to spell out the to document in a moment. I was just sort of trying to do that. Um, the, the three changes we made. OK, so, so you'll be coming to us with a, a, a more precise C. Um, I'm <laughs> trying to do that, absolutely. Okay. Well, one of the other options we do have is we're, we're an hour and a quarter um, overdue a break, um, which for some people might be becoming difficult. Um, would you like some time to do that? That would be wonderful, thank you. OK, I'm going to take a comment from Nigel. Um, and then um, I think we might give ourselves a wee adjournment to allow Leanne and Jotham to have a break as well and um, and to get the wording right for this. Um, comments, Nigel? Thanks, uh, Your Worship. Um, Leanne is saying that she's comfortable with the th June the 3rd, and it seems to me that when you boil it down, shifting the meeting further out is only to allow a model to be run to show the impact on individual rates and the fact of the matter is we can, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually matter what they show under the under the, the, the any model they are what they are and um and i i, and what I, I wanted to comment before sanchez's comment when you when you start shifting meetings around and the work entailed and trying to sandwich it in into an already crowded calendar 
uh, it, it starts to become difficult. So for me, if, if the answer is, if the only reason we're to shift the meeting is so we can all angst over how the, how the impact of whatever we do is on individual rates, then that doesn't seem to me a substantial enough reason to, to shift the timing when Leanne says she's comfortable with the time frame as it is. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think um, it was just it was just checking that we weren't putting staff under unnecessary pressure. Ple uh, pleasure. I doubt if we do that under unnecessary pressure um, at that time. OK, look, what I suggest we do is this. It's now 12 minutes past three. I'm going to call an adjournment, leave this sitting as it is, call an adjournment so we can have a break um, and be looking at coming back at 3.30 if all councillors and staff could be available to come back at 3.30. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that just means um, don't hang up. Because Rebecca, what's the best way to handle this? You're going to put a sign up on the... Yes, I'm going to use my unfettered power to mute all <laughs> and I have uh, put up a, an adjournment notice and okay. if you want to if you still want to use teams or something else you can leave the call and come back to it rejoin yes. you, can, you can hang uh, up and come back to it if you want to clear your line yes okay thank you neil uh, thank you all right thank you everybody enjoy a brief break
Okay, folks, are we all back? Importantly, is Leanne back? Okay, oddly enough, I can't hear anybody now. Um, so just bear with me, please. I don't think anyone was talking, Tim. Ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah oh. Liam was talking to herself. <laughs> ah, brilliant. I did have my headphones cut out at one stage, so I was worried I was losing battery power. They're not, I've actually borrowed them, so I'm not too sure. Okay, so it's um, 3.32 now. Apologies, I was a wee bit late. Um, it's like getting around Fort Knox here at the moment, so um, that's okay. That's how it is. All right, I'm going to take us now to, um, I'll reopen the meeting, of course, and take us now to page 167 of the agenda. And we've got A and B, obviously, and now um, Leanne, you've typed up a C there, recommends the annual plan to be amended to reflect the following decisions made after the consideration of all submissions and council deliberations. So C1 is to reserve fund the balance of the grants at 511,672 from the Disaster Relief Fund. I'll pause from reading the um, thing there to say that we will come back and do that. Um, we just have to formally do it. Two, to rate for all the water, wastewater and waste minimization to the value of $1 million. $1 million. Three, oh, to use dollars, yep. <laughs> Three, to use projected further savings of 270,000 and not carry forward savings from personal and pools to, incre to fund increases. Four, to add back in the Wilding Pines grant of $20,000 and make the adjustments recommended by the Tevet Valley Community Board to fund the grant for the community pool at 14750 and to allow Cromwell Community Board to reserve fund 15,000 to carry out the seismic assessment. So that's C. I'm going to move A, B and C, and I'm going to ask my Deputy Mayor to second that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, all those in favour? Well, Tim, just yes. before you vote, sorry, can I just ask No, yes, you can. Help? I should have asked for discussion. Are you sure that $271,000 is the right figure? Yes. Uh, actually, where Leanne, are we? I, Oh, um, I forgot to change it in there. I changed it in my spreadsheet and not in my words because I already got right, to that. Right. So, sorry, it's 340? 340, yes. Yes. Um, so and it's that, a 1 uh, million. Sorry, which yeah. figure? Two, the 270 in C should be 340. Thank you. All at point three, yeah. Thank you, Nigel. Um, and Shirley had asked if there was an alteration at the Cromwell Community Board. I can't remember one. Was anyone else there can yeah, remember one? It's in there. Ah, oh. yeah, you mean other than that? No, that was the only one that I recall was to uh, allow the Community Board reserve fund the seismic work. Are you there, Jotham? I'm sure that was the only one we had. Well, yes, maybe Shirley, it. Shirley, you'd asked if there was a Cromwell Sorry Community Board. It, 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 <laughs> I should have moved my page up a wee bit. I didn't see it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No, no, no worries at all. So with that alteration of 270 to 340 in bullet point three, thank you for that, Nigel. Are there any other uh, comments? Any further Jot discussion? Jotham, Jotham, hello. Yeah. Just wanted to add to the 511,000, that number may change once we add um, Teviat and uh, uh, the Wilding Pines, just because those were removed oh. and that was the difference. So when we add those back, that number will change. Although so we I haven't, we haven't no. allowed for carry forwards, Jotham. Yeah, that too. So, so I don't know if we put a prox. leave it open. Yeah. Yeah. If you put approximately that, that allows you the leeway to do to deal with um, those smaller amounts. Will that, will that work? Yes. yes. As long as, as, long as okay. you don't come to the June meeting saying it was four hundred eleven thousand. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Le Leanne. Could you please um, cut and paste that original bit and and then just correct the, um, well, you could just do it there, couldn't you? Yes, I can. Yeah, just so we have those absolutely rock solid. Just wondering if that one million makes um, makes a lot of sense. If you put a full stop on I, it. I, yeah, I know what I'm saying, but obviously there's more than a million that we 
in total costs there. It's just that we were proposing to to carry it forward of um, reserve fund a million, and I haven't made that clear. Recognize any one to reserve fund the balance of grants at approximately. Rebecca's done it for you there. Five eleven. Oh. We have you. Can you see what Rebecca's oh, put I up? can. Yep. I just hadn't added approximately. Sorry. OK, approximately. 511 disaster to rate for all the water. To rate and I wonder if I put in brackets not reserve fund. Not reserve fund. Yes, the balance of. I just feel it, it sends a message. It's only a million dollars and we know it's not. Mm. The balance of the water, wastewater and waste minimization to the value of one million dollars. Three to use projected further savings of three hundred and forty. Yeah. And not carry forward savings from personnel and pools to fund increases. Four to add back in the Wilding Pines grant of twenty thousand and make the adjustments recommended by TV Valley Community Board to fund the grant for the community pool at fourteen seven fifty and to allow Cromwell Pool to reserve fund fifteen K for any carry out of the seismic assessment. To carry out. How okay. does that look? <laughs> Looked prettier when Rebecca did it, but no. That's oh, fine. sorry, Rebecca. She's <laughs> far better at it than me. It, the words are right. I think that's the crucial thing. Other than it's Tibet Valley Community Board, not Ward, but that's that's a typo that can be easily fixed. Oh, yeah. So can I so can I just clarify something from that then? Yeah. So that when people see this in its current form and get their rates bill, they'll find that the paying what was expected to be paid for the three waters. But there will be savings and other parts of their rates bills to indicate the reserve funding and saving funding. Correct. So we went when we went out to the yeah. when we cool. went out and consulted, we were rating for that million dollars. We've looked at other ways to get around that. We're still going to rate for the million, but we're looking at other ways to find savings so that their rates bill is no longer 4.99. Instead, we're, we're, we expect it to be an average rate increase of 1.1. Yes, no one's rate bill was 4.9. It was a 4.99 average. Now will be one point, approximately 1.1. Yep, give or take once we throw it all in there and. Yep. And the communication. My spreadsheet. And the communication that must go with that is that that does not mean that everyone's will be 1.1 because we still have the the factors that we cannot change. Well, it certainly but, won't. It certainly won't be because the effect of that will be that that the um, people connected to the three waters and using the waste services on wheelie bins will, will still get the lion's share. So they will see nothing like 1.1. They'll see the true increase of that. That's that's that is what. It is. <laughs> so Neil, you raise a valid point. I thought we had it was there not. Um, just that line two, Leanne, I'm just still a wee bit confused with that. And I think that's what Neil's pointing because I <laughs> thought there was some targeting to reduce some of the cost of the water, wastewater and waste minimisation. But due to the bow wave, we're no longer doing that. No, that was reducing, removing the bow wave because if we do this is what we've consistently talked about. If, well, two parts to it. One, the bow wave. Two, is it is it fair to use the district wide. Disaster relief fund to offset targeted rates. The executive committee thought so, but um, yes, we had thought so. So we can still go back if that's the case, then we could go back and ignore the disaster relief fund, carry on rating for that, but only use half a million for your water, wastewater and waste minimisation using the disaster relief. Or you can use 511, whatever you choose to use. That has yeah. to be a call from council. Yeah, why, why I'm raising that is because I thought that was where the biggest concern was, is that, that because of the way it's an average, but when the lion's share is falling in one particular sector, and that's those connected to those services, that was the whole idea, was trying to minimise that by by using reserves to to offset that. So we did have the rate for much, but you you quite rightly point we do that at the expense of having a bow wave issue going forward. So 
um, that's something we need to discuss and work our way through. And if people are happy, want to get rid of the bow wave, this is the way to do it. What you just said is you can you can offset that bow wave to an extent by um, reducing that by half or something like that. That's better than nothing. Um, and it's certainly the, the one I would I would favour us looking at because at least with an LTP year we get a chance to look at those bow wave issues and do something about it. And it's not as big if you do it this way. And if we still and if we still rated for the entire same grants budget as we've got right now, there will still be that the same bow wave. It's just that the public can consult on grants. They can't really consult on this. Yes, yep. it's going to go. Do you know what I mean? It's. But we can still do it your way. I mean, it's. But we'd be creating a half million dollar bow wave next time. Correct. When potentially in 12 months time, I hate to say it, things are possibly going to be tougher. Of course, you're paying your rates up to that 12 months. It's not right now. Damned Correct. if we do and damned if we don't. And so we're trying. It's, it's, a, it's a balancing act because all the advice we've received so far is to continue with our annual plans that have come out of our long term plans to continue pretty much as we as we started with and as we consulted. So it's it's, it's a catch 22. In fact, for those who listen to the Solgum webinar, they made it quite clear it, it would be questionable to go from a and they use 5%, a 5% rate increase to a 0% rate increase without reconsulting. However, to decrease somewhat would be acceptable. And so it's finding that balance and then particularly it's particularly in particularly in line of the submissions we've had. Leanne, if we're going from a 4.99% average to a 1.1, even those urban areas who are already uh, who, who aren't going to be as recovered as much by this as we had initially thought, they're still going to see some significant reduction, are they not? Correct, they are. They are still going to see a significant reduction. I haven't got a lot of examples in front of me, but I've had a, a, a nosy at some of the examples from when it was just under, when it was zero essentially. I can't see any huge there's still a couple of biggies. Omacow Hotel would still be still nowhere near where it was, but it's still quite high. Um, but most of the residential are sitting, or they just about appear to be the few I can see. The samples I can see are all under 10%, which they weren't before. They were sitting at 13, 16. I, I still can't offset the fact that places like Naseby have had huge capital value increases, mm. and that's I can't get around that. I don't know how to get around that operating within. And that's what it comes down to. Because you can. In many, in many regards, we, we have got very, very clear legal advice has been given to the whole sector that we cannot go playing with those capital and land values. People no. have had, in my own case, the valuation almost doubled. And, and that doesn't help when it comes to putting your hand in your pocket to try to pay it, but it's the consequence of that that we can't control. And the other little bit we've got is, is Cromwell, for instance, have had a, the, a bigger slice of the growth as well. So some of their costs can be spread against more people for mm. the targeted ward stuff, whereas Naseby hasn't got that same growth. Maniototo okay. hasn't got that yeah. same growth. Mm. I don't think there's going to be an easy way around it, folks. We gone. either That's we either gone. look at it in the look at it in the eyes now, or we double our problems and our community's problems next year. Um, I'm hearing someone trying to speak. Do they want to let me know who they are so I can go oh, to them? Thank you. All right. Oh, bye. I think that's someone on the phone. Tim. That's Stu on the phone with his mic open. <laughs> um, Tim, can I just clarify, please, um, Leanne, on point three that I've got there? There was a double two. I just wanted to make sure that wasn't intentional. Can you read my three and see if that's what it should say? To use projected further savings of three. Oh, there's two savings of three hundred and forty thousand, and to not carry forward. Yeah, that's so what I've, I've got. got. I've just tweaked and I've put dollars under the one million and put in brackets. Um, I've got a new one there in the chat, Leanne. Oh, OK, under it's three. It's much easier to read Rebecca's one, Leanne. Cool, excellent. Your respect. Gonna, cool, let me get rid of mine so then I can come down because I'm seeing it. I just can't see it. 
It's pretty big. It was put in at 3.36. Are you in the afternoon chat or have you in, in the yeah. wrong chat? Oh, you know, I'm here. Sorry. It's so to reserve fund the balance of grants 511 from the disaster relief to rate for all of the wastewater and waste minimization to the value of $1 million. I thought we we're going to put that's the one I was changing. We have, mm. It's the last chat in the sequence. I've changed it. I've updated it. Yeah, I think Leanne still needs to change that um, C bullet point too. Oh, sorry, I yeah. might not have pressed enter. Yeah, because yes. I can't see anything. Yeah, there you go. Don't just come through. <laughs> I could see it. <laughs> I couldn't see it. <laughs> yes, to, res to rate, not reserve fund the balance, of the yes, to the value of $1 million I'd put, to use projected savings of 340, not carries, yep, and to add back, correct. Correct, all of that is perfect. Other Great. than I'd put dollars after, I oh, know you don't need to, you got, no, leave that perfect. Where are we at with how we're going to reserve fund? Are we going to use the disaster relief fund for the grants or for half a million of the waters and waste minimisation? If we do it for the waters and waste minimisation, we would see a further drop in the uh, urban rating this year. We would yes. potentially create a bow wave, or we would create a bow wave for next year. But that right. bow wave that we created for next year, can we, if we wished, do more within our rating and finance policy to uh, to alleviate that at that time? Yeah, I think we should go that way. That bow wave's otherwise too big. Leanne said in her indicator one she's got, she's got 10% increases still in the urban area. Um, I don't think that people will see that as being um, sustainable or, or suitable either, um, just because it's down from 14 or 15. Yeah. Yep, I think we've got to. I, I think we've. I agree with you, Neil. I notice everyone else is being really quiet, um, but I agree. And I'm going to actually go around um, once we've got a bit of a, a better place to land. It would be creating a bow wave for next year, but we can. We have got other means because it's an LTP year to deal with that bow wave. I'm still thinking anything, even though it's a 1.1 average, anything around 10% is is just not acceptable. How do we change the words on that? No, maybe we need to go around. Right. So we remove. I guess your question. You've got two questions there. We, you still, no matter what you do, there, there's a. So you've got a half a million dollar bow wave. If you go and do all the grants next year, you've still got half a million bow wave. What you're doing is making a choice to reserve fund a particular targeted area and not not everybody from a district wide reserve fund. Correct. And and the the logic as we discussed this at the executive committee, of course, council can override that, but that was done because there was no time to do it any other way. Was that by if if the five eleven goes into the water, wastewater, and waste minimisation, then it is only the ratepayers in the urban areas that includes urban as well as um, as commercial will receive the benefit of that, and the rural who over the years contributed to the fund, not the interest, but the technically should gain the interest, will not. But this is at a time where we're addressing the, 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 the imbalance between a massive saving for the rural as opposed to a massive increase for the urban. And there may be some in the rural sector that would say, hey, it's not fair. We've contributed to that and the interest is only going to the townies. But on the other hand, I would be very surprised if the rural folk went, we are getting a big saving here because of this one part of the equation, but I resent interest that we actually um, has been accrued over a long period of time, some of which is ours, uh, being applied to the towns, um, which are facing a 10% rate increase when some of us are getting a 30% rate and decrease. There's nothing fair in taxes, and that's what rates are, but I believe that we all rely on each other and that the country is getting some really big relief through what we've got um, as a system that we can't change. But there is a method here where we can apply some relief to the towns and at a time when people will be under some extreme financial pressure, um, I believe that's the right thing to do. And you're never going to make everybody happy. Um, I would like to see that 511 applied to the water, waste, water and waste minimisation. Okay, so... But I'm going to go around the other councillors before you start typing numbers and changing things. So I, I'm, I'll make that very clear that if we reserve fund that 511, if we put that 511 from the disaster fund into wastewater, 
waste and minimisation and water, the town rates are going to get the benefit they're going to drop, but keep in mind that the country rates are already getting significant drops. I'm going to go around the room um, and I'm going to go backwards from where I started last time because I've got a random list here. Shirley, you're first up. What are your thoughts? The 511 to three waters. OK, thank you. Stewie? Yeah, well, it probably is. It's rural's had a pretty good run, but yeah, I no, sort of, yeah, okay. Thank you. Nigel, where are you at? Uh, I think that's the best compromise. Um, apply that, res that uh, emergency reserve to, to the three waters. Thank you. Cheryl? Uh, totally agree. Yeah. Thank you. Ian? Yeah, agree with that. Thank you. Tracy? Yeah, I have no problem with it being applied to three waters. Um, and just uh, just so you know, I'm going to have to come off this call so I can get kids back to boarding school. So it'll okay. be a bye for me too. Thank you. Appreciate your effort. I know it's been difficult on a day that you had to get your kids back and there was no movement in when you were able to do it. So I appreciate what you've managed to do um, to be with us for almost all the day. Thank you, Tracy. Um, just please note when you do leave um, in the chat, Tracy, so that we've got that for the minutes. Tamer, where do you sit? Uh, it's a really hard one. I don't know that I do agree. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of people who will be losing jobs and things in the rural community as well, and I'm worried that people um, might get left behind, but I see that there is some greater good in it. So, yeah, it's a tricky one. OK, thank you. Lindley? Yes, I'm, I'm, I agree with that. 511 to the urban three walkers. Thank you. Martin? Martin? You're on mute, mate. Agree. Agree, agree, Th agree. Thank you. Um, Stephen's no longer with us. And Neil? Yeah, um, I think it's the right thing to do because the tools are available for us in the long term plan year to, to work through that bow wave issue, which is not as big. Um, and I know that that you know you could make the observation that it's a few um, uh, a few getting the um, the um, yeah every, everywhere's paying for a few, but it's a big few. Um, and we never think twice about the fact that if you go and look at our rating but um, rate, and I think the rates that we collect from one ward um, are, are, are quite a large chunk of where the, um, of the roading rate and, and when you go and look at the wards where the expenditure is, it, it doesn't uh, match up. So we have that all the time. So it's not an uncommon occurrence at all. Um, and I don't, I don't think we should be um, um, worried by, by that issue. Um, you know, we see a lot of times um, bad weather events and those sort of things out in the, the other areas. And, and you'd argue that a lot of that funding comes from um, areas where um, that's not being impacted on. That's what you get with having things digitised, and that's one of the benefits of it. You get that ability to work those things and, and help each other out. So I think it's a good a good compromise that, that works in this really unique and um, unusual situation we find ourselves in. Um, you know, th this is this is really new uncharted territory and we're trying to, um, you know, adapt to it the best we can. And I think we've shown here that we've, we've, we've um, thought it through and, and got a good outcome if we go that way. Thank you. So um, Neil and I had moved um, um, A, B and C. We now need to change C. Uh, Leanne. Um, I've, I've rewritten it, ready to hit send to you all. I just want to clarify something. Yes. Does it, given that we're not using grants now, can we round it? Because the 511672 was purely the figure of grants outstanded, outstanding. I'm a little bit concerned at how my finance team are going to make R this. Round it, round it to a half a million. I don't have a problem with that. Thank you. It'd be a lot easier for the team. Yes. Finance is ever that precise, is it? To be 511622. That's what I was Not. getting at. I was thinking this is <laughs> going to be really, really hard on them. I could just about hear Jotham getting ready to shoot me. Here's my thoughts because I've taken this now only. Uh, doesn't add back in. Right. There's only three now. Oh, it won't let me do it. <laughs> I was hitting enter, but it kept giving new numbers. 
So we've only got three now because we don't have the disaster. We don't have the grants in there. Can you all see that? No. Are you no. in the afternoon chat? Yeah, I believe so. Oh, I followed Tracy. <laughs> it's there. No, it's there. Oh, it is there. Oh, there it is. My apologies. Oh, I had one each. Oh. Yeah, sorry. I was looking at <sighs> odd cut and pasted, but hadn't sent. Right. So, Neil, um, because I'd moved it and you'd second it. It's everybody. Sorry. Have a look at this. Where does that leave our grants, Leanne? So our grants back to being reserve funded, yeah. uh, rate funded, right. like rate they fund. originally were. Yep. Across everybody, right up. Yep. So I'm just going right. to check that'll that'll slightly change it because it's it's 500, not 511. So you're sitting at approximately five. You're still sitting around the one percent after we growth. The, we need the reduce from one million. Yeah, I was wondering Probably. about that. I don't know if you do or not. It was just no, to make it clear. You do. Take okay. that up. Okay. All right, folks. I'm sorry that has been a long and laborious process, but it was never going to be easy. Um, and actually, before I move and ask my deputy to second um, A, B, and C with the new C, um, I'm sure you're in agreement, Neil. You have to be a seconder, but I don't think I even need to ask you. Um, I really want to sincerely thank Leanne Jotham and their team or, or your team, Leanne. Um, every long term plan in particular, um, but every annual plan, the mayor says these things, but uh, really um, the work that you have done and the circumstances that you have done them is just staggering. And I don't know if anyone outside of your team or, or perhaps the executive team here or um, myself with a, with a vague understanding would appreciate it because not only have you had an annual plan that you have had to turn upside down um, and, and really make some big changes with, but you had to also ascertain how much you were able to do of that, um, which was in itself extraordinarily difficult. You had to do that at a time when we were all under immense psychological and emotional pressure with not knowing what um, COVID-19 was going to do to ourselves and our family's health. Um, and you were having to suddenly do this working from home, which in Jotham's case has been Wellington. And on top of that, Leanne um, and, and some of the others in your team have been working in the Emergency Operations Centre. So when I put all of those facets together, um, I really am actually lost for words to express my admiration and my thanks for you um, getting us to this point. It's been absolutely remarkable. So congratulations and thank you. And having thank said you. that, I will now move um, A, B and C as it is on the screen with the reduced from 1 million removed. I'll seek my Deputy Mayor to second that. I'll second that, Your Worship. Thank you very much. No further discussion. In that case, I'll ask for a vote. All those in favour? Aye. <laughs> and against? And that with a great deal of relief is carried and with, as I've said, a huge amount of thanks. Thank you, Leanne. You're not quite off the hook yet, though. Um, we need to go back to page 36 of the agenda and just deal with that disaster recovery. Um, and I think the um, simple thing to do there is that if you look at page 36, I'll move A and B with the change to B, it becomes 500,000. Um, but we would keep that or adjusted amount following the annual. No, it would just it no. would just 500,000 full stop. Correct. And C and C is removed. Um, Somebody want to second that? I will, Nigel. Thank you, Nigel. Any discussion? In that case, I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. And against? And that is carried. And Leanne, I'm looking at my run sheet and I think you can go and pour yourself a rather gla large glass of Chardonnay or something because that's been a very difficult day. Oh, Jotham, you've, you. got, you've got to stay until about half past five, Jotham, but Leanne, you can go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much. It's been Thank a very, very difficult um, time. Um, and thank you too to councillors. That was a, an extraordinarily good discussion and um, has got us, I believe, 
to the right result at the end. OK, thank you, everybody. Um, taking us now to page 366. Um, just, just before I do that, I, I hope I didn't miss anybody in giving my sincere thanks there. And I should also, I know I missed somebody, and that's Sanchia, who's had a great deal to do with that as well. Um, so Sanchia, thank you for your work in that as well. My apologies for not um, recognising you at the um, initial discussion. Righty-ho, so we have a report now. Julie Muir stepping up to the plate. Um, yes, Julie, your report. Um, right, thank you. Um, so I'm going to take the report um, on the Three Waters Investigation collaboration as read. Um, and just a couple of points that I'll add to that is um, we have been advised during the COVID-19 lockdown that the government is proceeding with the th review of the three waters um, and they have a deadline of the end of 2021 for councils to consider voluntary change for water service delivery arrangements. Um, the expectation is that the new entities will be formed and operating in 2023. At the same time as councils are being given the opportunity to look at voluntary um, change, the government is working on development of models for potential legislated reform. So the work that the Otago Southland councils have commenced on is um, to enable the region to consider what, which options um, for voluntary change would best suit our region. Um, this work is just the investigation um, any work um, decisions that um, could come up from that investigation will come back to the participating councils to consider whether they want to proceed further and then there would be public consultation regarding that. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, um, um, Julie. And um, Nigel, you're the lead of um, Three Waters, so I'll pass over to you for further comment. Uh, the only comment I'd make on the report is that the proposals, uh, which are, as Judy said, coming from central government, I believe have the potential to change radically the way in which local government is run. And depending what is implemented and when it is implemented, it, it has the potential to change the political and constitutional balance between central and local government. So this is, this is big grunty stuff that we're starting on down um, and I think this is I think this is just the, the opening shot and what's going to be quite a long process and an important process to to uh, keep our to keep a close control on so so that would cover that I'd like just before Judy goes if I may Tim if she could, I had two or three things that I think members would be interested in getting an update on. The first of them is the, the two shovel ready project applications that relate to the if really could maybe give an update, update on their status. Secondly, it would be interesting to have an update on its potential impact on operational. Uh, operational activities going forward. And thirdly, related to that, an update on how planning for the next year's capital work program is, is progressing, because that, those last two items have the potential to have quite a big impact on jobs and uh, economic activity in the district. So Julie, I'd ask you to maybe cover off on those three, if you, if you would. OK, um, thank you. Nigel, um, yes, so we have two um, applications into the shovel ready funding for water and wastewater projects. The first of those is a combined application for the Clyde Alexandra water and wastewater major projects that are, are underway. And we have requested um, $16 million from that fund um, that would then go on top of the funding that council is already um, committed to for both the Lake Dunstan water supply and the Clyde wastewater project. We are um, anticipating increased costs and that is um, in part due to the um, Lindavia in the lake. Um, so we're, I'm, I'm relatively hopeful that that project meets um, all of the criteria for the shovel ready funding. 
Um, and then the second one is um, for pipeline and reservoir projects. And that request was for $14 million. And it basically brings forward work that we had currently um, in the in the long-term plan that was in years 2023-27. And so that involves uh, the construction of two reservoirs and a number of um, rather major pipeline upgrades or replacements. So any questions on the shovel-ready projects? Right, I'll um, carry on. So in terms of oh, our capital... Sorry. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Julie, Neil Gillespie. Um, did I read unless you're going to go to it next, but did I read something somewhere about some of these projects are now going to go to the PGF and they're not going to be considered by, um, what's his name's um, big fund? Yeah, so that's that's correct. We did get a message telling us that projects under $20 million had been redirected to the Provincial Growth Fund. I am still waiting on some um, information that should be out any day on what projects are being put up to the, the government for the shovel ready. Yeah. Probably uh, most of New Zealand's waiting with bated breath for that one. So I think um, I'm not sure where the Clyde Alexandra wastewater project will end up and water projects will end up sitting because the combined value of that project is over $20 million. But we, although we haven't asked government for that much money. Yes, yeah, so we, um, yeah, we we do know that we made the uh, top 800 that got got included for further consideration out of the original 2000. That's the most important thing. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so in terms of our capital works program for next year, we are um, well advanced in terms of where we would normally be um, in progressing our business as usual renewals work. Um, and we're certainly putting a lot of focus on catching up on some of the backlog of work that has been um, carried over from previous years. So we would expect to be in a position to give the, um, the go ahead to, on our capital works program um, in around June, July, whereas normally that wouldn't be happening through until about October, December. Um, and in addition to that, the team has been working on a resilience plan for the last six months, and that considers events that will impact infrastructure and the vulnerability of our infrastructure to those events, and then the consequence to service delivery if they were to, to occur. So we are getting a list of work that would need, to, would need to be done to mitigate those risks, and we're working through that um, and prioritising the projects and estimating the costs and that will come to council for consideration as part of the next long term plan. Thanks, Julie. Um, Sanchi, you were going to add. Sorry, I just had a wee bit of a computer meltdown then, but I'm back. Um, I was only gone for 30 seconds. <coughs> um, Sanchi, you had some um, something to add to the um, shovel ready projects, I think. Oh, it was just very briefly. Um, whilst we had notification that anything under 20 million has been diverted to the PGF, um, nobody in central government knew about that figure, so we still don't know if that was a typo or an actual, and as Julie rightly said, where our projects sit other than in the top 800. Mm. Wait and see, keep crossing your fingers. Okay, thank you for that. I'm going to take us back to the report um, that, that we had and the recommendations in it, and I'll totally agree with uh, Nigel's comments that the changes that the government is promulgating in the three waters will make for a fundamental change to the place of local government, maybe the shape and the size of local government in New Zealand. Um, there's two arguments. Uh, well, in fact, there's many arguments, and I've had many of them with different mayors, um, that um, on the one hand, it's, it's local assets being taken away by Wellington. Is this the potential end result of this? And that is not something that um, somebody living in central Otago, a long way from Wellington, should be at all excited about. But on the other hand, um, there has been some councils that perhaps could have done a better job of looking after those assets. And there is an argument that when you have, and probably very um, pertinent to say this today, that when you have elected bodies 
um, determining how much people are going to have to pay to make their water and very unsexy projects under the ground um, work properly, you run the risk that some councils, unlike this one, won't take their um, obligations seriously enough. And I continually refer other mayors to the fact that if they want to make a start, they need to look at volumetrically charging. So there's a great distance for this to go. And I think as councils, we have two choices. One, we can throw our hands in the air and say, no way, Jose. Or two, we can step inside the tent, which is what is being done in Otago and Southland. We can find out what is there for the benefit of New Zealand as a whole. And we can take the opportunity to find out absolutely as much as we can in this space um, to best position ourselves to see what's coming next and to um, take our part in it. So I, I think it's um, it's something to be concerned about, but it sure as heck isn't something to ignore. Do you have anything to add to that, Nigel? I think that sums up uh, pretty well, Your Worship. Um, it's it's early days, and and I think it's good that we've got a forum for the Otago and Southland local authorities to start doing some work on on possible options on a regional level. Um, so it is very much a case of watch this space. Mm. Cheryl, you're the deputy uh, lead on Three Waters. Do you have anything to add? Um, I just would wonder how that would make a difference uh, to our rates because how can they rate us for something that actually uh, we're now not, um, well, we don't own anymore. If, they, if they're going to, um, it would be a user pays that have to charge us, that have to bill us individually, wouldn't they? Yeah, the um, the government has a number of different models that it's looking at and one that they're very attracted to is the Tasmanian model and I've done a lot of work on how it operates and so it um, in a staged manner and I think uh, that it wasn't deliberately staged it was just the way it worked out um, had some amalgamations of various councils into um, three waters and wastewater but not um, not um, What's the other one? I'm getting tired. <laughs> not the, not the storm water. Storm water. Thank you. Um, um, amalgamated eventually into one overall network um, for um, Tasmania. And when that process started, they had 26 different communities that were on permanent boil water notices. So they were in the dark ages, realistically. So it's permanent, not just occasionally. Um, the, the model that was set up was that if you were, um, depending on what assets you put into the conglomeration, um, that depended on how many shares you got and how many shares you got um, decided how much dividend your council got from the operation. So it was quite remarkable to me that that uh, we don't get a dividend from our water. It basically balances itself out as it should. Um, but this was put into almost a corporate structure where the councils got given a dividend. But then it was found that there wasn't enough investment going on and those dividends uh, at the moment aren't getting paid out. So what it would mean if it went the whole way of the Tasmanian model, would mean a um, potentially a South Island wide um, water provider that would remain in public ownership and um, and councils would be out of the um, business of pouring water into the tap and removing it out the um, out the sewage line and that would fall on a corporation. People would get um, a bill each quarter or whatever from whatever the New Zealand or the South Island equivalent of TAS water is and um, that's where it poses a threat for um, councils because that's sort of 20 percent of our reason for existing gone but as i say long way to go um tim can i just add to that yes, to, let's imagine a council without three waters to but and and what i've seen which is mostly the last cabinet paper reported there's absolutely no talk of a regulatory impact statement or anything about costs at all this is this is all about um uh, delivering safe water, I, you can put a, 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 a ring around the fact that if you ended up with um, a regional or a South Island entity running it and, and people being billed for the water, you, you can look forward to your water rates going up by a factor of two or three or four, I would I would be my guess. Because the, the economies of, of doing this um, and the financial benefits or uh, lack of benefits don't even seem to be on the screen. Well, there's a lot. There's a long way to go. Um, yeah, 
and we might leave it there given we've chewed through a lot of time today and we, I know you and I um, and Cheryl in particular and, and Julie could talk for instance, you could talk for hours on this. Look, um, this is really for noting this report. Nigel, do you want to move A, B, C and D and invite Cheryl to second it? I'm happy to move, Cheryl. I'm happy to second. Thank you. Any further discussion, councillors? In that case, I'll ask a vote. All those in favour, aye. Aye. And again. That's carried. Thank you very much uh, to the Three Waters and Waste Portfolio Lead and Chair and to Julie. And now we turn over to page uh, 370, which is Transportation Procurement Strategy. Um, and Julie, it's your report again. Um, yes, so once again, I will take the report as read. Um, and I'll just point out that this is a procedural requirement that we need to meet for the New Zealand Transport Agency. Um, and our last procurement strategy uh, came to its end in 2018. So within the period between the last one finishing and this one being adopted, there hasn't been any procurement or, or new tenders let within that period of time. So um, it, yeah, very much a procedural requirement in our case, but one that's necessary to, um, to secure our funding. Thank you. Stu, you're the uh, lead for roading. Do you have anything to add to this? No, we had a discussion about it on Friday afternoon. It just seems to be procedural, so no, it's all good with me. You're happy to move it? I'll move the uh, report we received. Somebody second it. Tracy's not here. Second, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Um, any discussion on this? No, in that case, um, we will seek the vote. All those in favour? Aye. 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 And Aye. against? That is carried. Thank you, Julie. Thanks. Right, this takes us now to the proposed dog control bylaw and dog control policy, page 418. And Lee, this is your report. Kia ora koutou and good afternoon. Thank you everyone. I know today has been an important and challenging day for you, so I'll try and keep this short. Yeah, I'll take the report as read. Um, I guess the thing to highlight is that this is part of a programmed review of the bylaw and policies. Um, it takes into consideration the, the operational challenges that we've been experiencing um, from a dog control point of view, but but also from informal consultation that we've undertaken with, um, the, with the community, in particular with the Clyde community and the Cromwell community. Um, I think it's fair to say from the informal consultation that we undertook in late 2019 that the biggest hot topic was with regards to dog parks. And, and so that's basically the fencing of that have been identified that are currently designated dog exercise areas. Lee, Lee, I'm, Lee, I'm just going to pause you. Um, your sound quality is really bad. You're just that we're just starting to not be able to understand you. Are you on a microphone you can move or something similar? Yep, I'll try that. I'll try and move to a different part of the room if that's now. You're sounding like you're coming from Mars. Is, or a, is it any or better? A part of craft work. Try again. Is it getting any better? Yes, it is. Great, OK. Um, so as I was saying, sorry, is that this is part of the, the, the review and when we've consulted and did the informal consultation in the, the back end of 2019, the hot topic was dog parks. And so that's fenced areas where dogs can be exercised. Now in the report, I've identified two areas that are proposed both in Clyde and Cromwell, and that's through uh, sort of linking in with the communities in the, those areas as well. Um, the Alpha Street um, preferred location for this dog park. Currently there is a need for us, which is what we're doing, is linking in with, with Linz to seek authority to put a fence on that part of the reserve because that's managed by Linz and we're working through that progress with them for that. Um, Louise van der Voort and myself are meeting with the Vincent Community Board and the Cromwell Community Board on Wednesday evening, again to go through the, the fencing proposal on these reserve areas. Um, and I think if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but that's the, that's the main topic, I guess, that I just wanted to identify. Thank you, Lee. Um, Neil, this is your portfolio, so I'll let you um, comment first. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thanks, Lee. Um, a very um, full report and um, well informed um, by the um, survey that you conducted that obviously you got a very good response to. Was that 500 people or was that that responded? Yes, uh, 526, I think it was. Do you think they're all dog owners? Not all of them were dog owners. Um, I haven't got the percentage in front yeah. of me, uh, sorry, but uh, the, a, a lot of them were. So I think the, the, the key thing comes down to going forward is that um, this is a proposal that goes out for consultation um, and I guess how we're going to handle what the boards might think about now that the rubber is in the road in relation to the proposal to fence some areas. And I did I did I hear you say that the Alpha Street one was Linz? That's correct, uh, Neil. So um, we we were awaiting a response. I was hoping to have that response in time for this meeting, but unfortunately, it hasn't come through to date. Um, in in discussing that with Linz to enable us to fence that area, um, a proportion. This is not all of the area. Let me just qualify that. So the Alpha Reserve area. It's probably around about say a quarter to a third of the um, of that reserve nearest to the bowling club, basically. You know, I would have thought very, very small part of that was actually um, Lynn's land, only um, the, the, the margin that's a straight line from the corner of the bowling club building north towards that house, but um, we'll see what that looks like going forward. Um, I, I guess what what does concern me is if it goes out in this form, it would suggest to people that there's an expectation that's going to be fenced. And I guess what happens if the feedback you get from the community boards is not um, in relation to that for both um, TV and, uh, sorry, Vincent and Cromwell, if that's not the case. I guess if, if that's not the case, then I'd be seeking from uh, both of those community boards for their preferred locations, uh, and then I'd do further consultation with the community um, uh, from, from that point forward. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, just what I want to check something, but I know that Ian had a question earlier today that he flicked through that I um, might. Ian, do you want to just ask Lee yourself directly what that, that question is? I couldn't find the answer for it, unfortunately, so he, you, might, you might have better luck with Lee than me. It's Neil. Hi, hi Lee. Ian Cooney here. Um, just a few questions in regards to the proposed policy and bylaw. In the report on page 419 of the agenda, it states that staff can enforce the Dog Control Act and local provisions such as fouling and prohibited area. Um, but staff cannot enforce dogs required to be on a leash. Um, why can staff not enforce this? Hi Ian, first of all, um, I'm just scrolling down to, to that part um, on page 100, sorry, 419 you say? Yeah, I'm just wondering why staff are not able to enforce leash on, on leash areas. My apologies, that word not should not be in there. We can enforce that. <laughs> well done. <laughs> and yeah. yeah. Um, and um, in terms of um, like the aim of the policy is to give effect to the public's right to be free of risk and nuisance from dogs. And on the one hand, we're proposing to have separate areas of dog parks. And then on the other hand, we're proposing that town centres, malls and sports grounds change from prohibited areas to on leash areas. Um, to me, these two sort of seem to, to counteract each other and may lead to the potential risk of more um, complaints. Yeah, certainly. So so what we're looking at there is, is that we're, we're having dogs on leash, basically. And so where we have um, responsible owners, they're able to go and undertake activities. So for argument's sake, their families may be playing sports in these locations. And so they are able to go there with their dog on a leash, therefore under control to to observe what, what's taking place basically. Um, or the fact that they, they've they taken their dog for a walk down a park area, they're walking um, through a what would be a an on leash area in the town centre to go and grab a cup of coffee for argument's sake and then move on. So it's trying to incorporate the I guess the everyday living for our community in a responsible manner where people are safe and um, but maintaining prohibitions where absolute prohibitions are required. Mm -hmm. Surely so, you've got a question. Oh sorry Ian. 
Uh, with the fact that you are able to enforce those on leash areas, um, yeah, that changes changes my question. Yeah, th thanks for that, Lee. Shirley, you've got a question? Yeah, um, I read something and I can't just find it at the moment, but there were two areas that were mentioned for Cromwell. One was Victoria Reserve, which I think is in Donegal Street, and the other is the Alpha Street Reserve for fencing. So can you just clarify which one is being considered for fencing? Is it the Alpha Street Reserve or the Victoria Reserve? Hi Shirley, that's the Alpha Street Reserve. Right, thank you. Martin, you had a question? Uh, an observation that as a dog owner who currently takes his dog out for coffee and walks past dog prohibited signs and there's no enforcement, I fully support what's going on here with these proposed changes because responsible dog owners do take their dogs out for coffee. Um, and, you know, currently if we're not enforcing the, the, the current restrictions, it does make it a bit sort of hypocritical. That's all. Very good. Um, I just think, um, Lee, in answer to Shirley's question, does that mean that on page 421, where it says proposal, these are the Victoria Park Reserve in, Alpha, in Cromwell. And um, we need to change that to read Alpha Street. Just bear with me, I'm just trying to find that 421. 421, yeah. Sorry, Neil, can you just repeat that? Page 421, it's got, this is where it says under your proposal to allow for the establishment of fenced dog parks, and it says two exercise areas eligible to fence. These are Victoria Park Reserve and Cromwell. Yes. Um, we want to change that to Alpha Street. Alpha Street, that's correct. Yeah. Um, I, yeah Victoria, I, I, sorry, I just can't think there is some reference to Victoria Park, and I think it might actually be that particular area, but we probably don't know it by that. Um, Okay, so we can do that. Any other um, questions? Yeah, I do actually, Neil. I've got a couple of comments. Um, firstly, Lee, in relation to the dog park proposal, I've got to admit I was somewhat surprised to find this coming in under the dog control bylaw and dog control policy because I don't think they're linked. And if we just look at the um, E, and, and we're now having to have hurried conversations with the community board, but it's with the community boards. But for me, it is the nature of the consultation because the consultation went out and it was pause for thought or something. I can't quite remember the name of it. I don't own a dog, so I didn't look at it. And I don't believe that there would have been a lot of people um, would have looked at it. And I don't know what the opinions are of people who uh, now we're now going well down a pathway of fencing off land for the sole use of the dog owners or the primary use of the dog owners, um, which might not be a problem. But I don't think the non dog owners have actually been given a fair crack at this and we could be accused of not um, really giving them an opportunity to be heard. That's my first concern. My second concern, and I'm sorry, I've lost my, all my questions disappeared, so I need to get myself around um, the, the um, document a bit slower. The, the, the actual bylaw on um, dog fouling, um, to me, doesn't cover um, the situation, and unfortunately, it's not a situation that's not uncommon, of where somebody, and I don't understand why people do this, They'll stop, they'll pick up their dog um, droppings in a bag, walk 20 metres down the road and throw the bag under the tree. Um, and we've seen this at St Gerard's High School. You see any number of bags with poo in them um, along the rail trail. And it's mind boggling to me that somebody would do that. But the problem with the bylaw as I see it um, is that um, people have to immediately, I'm still struggling to find it, sorry, um, have to immediately pick up the um, the waste. Here it is, 7.2 on page 437. The owner of a dog or any person in charge that defecates must immediately remove the feces. It doesn't at any point say that they have to deposit them clearly. And, um, and, and it's a third point I want to come to, but my former lawyer would have um, would have 
had had fun if somebody was trying to enforce that in a case where somebody had actually picked them up and then thrown them away, although the Litter Act would apply. The other question I have is I didn't see in anywhere in this um, document what the fine is for allowing your dog to foul, uh, where it's incumbent in that, because I know it outrages me and it outrages other people. So sorry, that's three things in a row, um, but that's that's my queries. Thank you, Tim. Um, so to answer your, your first question, um, I, I guess you know the, the, the informal consultation that we've undertaken with over 500 comments, and I certainly take your point on what you're saying, is if council are minded to to um, resolve to, to put this document out for consultation, that's when the whole of our community has the opportunity uh, over the next four weeks to provide comments and feedback uh, from, from that point of view. Um, I guess the second point with regards to, to fouling is that the, the Act, um, and you mentioned the Litter Act in itself, but the way the bylaw is written to for the immediate removal of that faeces, I mean, if somebody was to pick it up and bag it, walk down the, the, the rail trail 50 metres and then throw it under another tree, that hasn't been removed. And so the infringement for leaving the waste um, in a public place still remains, as well as the implication under the Litter Act. Um, and to answer the question with regards to the fine, the fine is $300 for failing to comply with, uh, an, I guess, a clause within the bylaw. Does that okay. answer your questions? Um, partially, I'm sorry. I just think the wording of E um, put me um, crook because it seemed to me like it was separate. It was going to the hearings panel, wasn't part of the same um, process. So I'm fine with that. That's fine. We've got ourselves to a starting point. Um, seeing what the dog owners want, and we'll see what the um, what the rest of the community, which I, I I don't think many people would have a problem with it, but we need to ask them. So that's fine. Um, again, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get myself to the right page for that dog bylaw, um, because um, in terms of the fouling, I, I'd I'd love to run that in court where I'm still a lawyer, because I don't believe if uh, the pure reading of it is um, an agreement. Um, I don't agree, but that's. You know, if I don't agree, that doesn't matter. And is it a three hundred dollar fine for fouling? That's correct. So, and is that the is that the highest it can be under the whichever act, um, the litter act or dog control act? Under the, the Dog Control Act, yes, uh, the littering with the provisions that we've got, it would fall into a lower level and um, because we've got those four levels, if you recall, for, for the littering, the maximum for littering at the moment is 400, but that's more for a trailer. Um, so it would be the Dog Control Act that would go for. Right. I personally believe that whatever the law allows us is the maximum fine is what it should be, because I think this community's had an absolute guts full of dogs, guts fulls getting left lying around the place. Um, but that's just my view. Um, and I am struggling to find the 300 in it, but it, in terms of actually being written in the in the policy, but that's that's fine. It's sure to be there somewhere. So thank you for that. Sorry, just to qualify that, Tim, the, the 300 isn't in the bylaw, that's in the Act. And so ah. we, are, we have the details in the bylaw and that, ref, that reflects back into the Act where the infringe, infringement capabilities lie. Right, so where do we get to decide between the three and the $400? So that's sorry, two separate things. So the three hundred dollars is set in statute under the Dog Control Act. The oh. four hundred dollars is under the Litter Act that council um, ag agreed the levels of of uh, infringement amounts last year for the one, two, three, and four hundred um, for for the infringement capabilities. If you recall. Okay. Cool. Thank you. That's me satisfied on those ones. Thanks. Um... Lee and Tim. Um, Ian, you've got another comment you put in there. Just want to um, get that clarified with Lee. Yeah, that, that would be good. Um, just just in regards to the enforcement of the on leash restrictions. Um, is that how do you actually deal with that? What's the is there a fine for that? Or? Yeah, hi Ian. Yes, so so that again comes back to where we have provisions under the the Act 
um, for infringements. The infringements again are $300 for people not complying with the requirements in the bylaw basically. And so if we've identified on leash areas, then me as a dog owner, I walk through with my dog off leash, then I have the ability to, or the dog control officer to infringe that individual. Obviously we do it on a graduated response of education first and foremost, um, but we have that capability. Thank you. Um, thanks, Lee and Ian. Um, I think I've got all the questions. Does anybody have another one that I've missed? Um, so Shirley and Tim, you're both happy with the issue around the um, the fact that we notify a statement of proposal for the bylaw that um, everybody gets another crack effectively at making their views heard. That you've, you've resolved that? Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. Um, cool. I'm interested to know why the Victoria um, Reserve Park was, was in there in the first place, because to me that seems a much more sensible place to put it. I know, I know this isn't the time for the discussion, but I was quite happy when I thought that that was where it was going to be, rather than Alpha Street. <laughs> yeah, but I think the Alpha Street surely is um, between the bowling club and Sanders Place. I understand that, and I see yeah. a lot of people using that area. Yeah, but I, but I, I think you, if you go, that might have been, yeah. Um, the, the key thing about that is that the proposal is to have a conversation with the community board on Wednesday night about that. Um, and what I want to raise with, Ian, uh, with Lee now is saying, well, if that was to take place, um, are you better maybe to, to wait until you've completed that conversation with the community boards and seeing as we've got another meeting in two weeks' time, um, that this matter could maybe lie on the table until you've got the community board feedback to feed into this? Because if the community board chairman say, no, not interested, then it's probably not helpful to having gone out to consultation on something that the boards are saying no to. I agree with you. Uh, hi Neil, yes, um, no issue with that at all. We can we can certainly delay for, for that time frame and, and have this this element of, of the conversation um, left on the table and, and resolve it at that point in time if that works better for the community boards as well, obviously. Well, I, I don't, unless there's any urgency to this, and, and it not ordinarily be a six week delay to the next meeting, but seeing as it's only two weeks um, and, the, and the report you'll come back with additional information will be quite simple, yes or no. Um, because the last thing I think we want to do is go out and consult with the community and then find that, that the community boards have some really good reasons that, you know, dare I say, could make everybody say, oh, should have thought of that. Um, and we've raised a whole lot of expectations that we're going to fence, dog fence somewhere. Um, you know, um, maybe we should have that first so that can inform your proposal. Comes back on the 3rd of June meeting. Um, that would be, well, it's an option, certainly, whether it's the right one, I'm not 100% sure. Neil Martin, I agree. <clears throat> leaving it on the table because I think our board would like to discuss it as much as in, in detail as much as Cromwell would and <clears throat> if everybody's happy to that end I will um, move in that manner if people are happy. Yeah, stand by one. Um, Your Worship, do you want me to take this through the moving and seconding or do you want to pick up that part? How do you want to handle it? You've gone to sleep. You're the lead in this meeting. Do I know, but I just want to make, check how he wants to do it, that's all. Um, right, right, silence is good enough for me. Um, so if we were to um, receive the report as A, and uh, then that the item lie on the table until the 3 June council meeting. He says, just trying to read what Rebecca wrote for me. Just just that as um, resolution B. Um, Mark's prepared to move that. Someone prepared to second it. Yes, two here, I'll do that because it needs a bit of discussion about dogs and one having our corner there as well. Um, well, actually, just before we go down um, that tr track then, Stu, is there something that you think needs to happen for the Manitoto Community Board? Yeah, I think we've had a, a whole lot of discussion about wandering dogs more so than anything and attacking dogs and it's been a nightmare because we're a long way away from dog control officers and there's been kids chewed up or not chewed up too badly but there's been a bit of that going on and it's been a big issue and it always comes up so we, it wouldn't be a bad thing to have a discussion. Um, Lee, oh, Louise, have you got an issue with doing that? 
Um, so, so the conversations with regards, it seems to be a slightly different conversation, if I can say that. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. happy to obviously have those conversations with that community board uh, of what we're doing with dog control and the issues that they're experiencing. Absolutely happy to do that as a as a separate conversation to what the topic, I think, to what we're discussing with Cromwell and Vincent at the moment. Yep. OK, and I think, too, that those issues um, that um, that those issues are actually provided for in the bylaw and probably Stu in the first instance, the good chance is you might get a chance to have a talk with Louise and or Lou, uh, Louise and um, and or Lee between now and the 3rd of June meeting to work those issues through, but I don't think they're fatal to the bylaw because of they're not. Uh, yeah, all right, that's good. We'll leave it at that then. So um, Martin moved A and B that it lie on the table to the 3rd of June council meeting. Someone like to second that, please. Stu, you did, that's right. Yep, any more discussion? If not, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Aye. Carried. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Apologies there. My headphones went flat and they did that by stopping me talking. Um, and then they stopped me listening and then they just took me out of the whole meeting. So I'm back. Um, I don't think I was out for very long. So thank you for looking after that. That brings us now to page 525. Roland Housing. Saskia, welcome. Please take us through. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll make um, this very short given the, the time in the, the afternoon. So when you last considered this um, project, you gave us an indication you'd like to receive further advice around promote density and incentivise options. Um, and, and also at that time, you indicated you'd like some further advice around um, what a secure home model could look like. So the next step at that point had to uh, was to invite um, Julie Scott and Steve Brent to the next council meeting, which we duly did, but of course COVID um, has since um, turned our world upside down. So Louise Van der Voort and I have done some thinking around um, the potential impacts in COVID on the housing, um, uh, sort of the, the housing world really, um, which is very unknown. So what we're coming to you today with is a uh, suggested new approach around doing some further work around obviously that promote density and incentivise options that you had indicated earlier, but also doing some work um, around what a more proactive role uh, with council and housing could be. So for example, that could be to develop higher density housing options in line with the Cromwell Master Plan. And then further to push out um, that further work around a secure homes model um, to next year when we can give you a further updated market um, guidance around what's happening within the market world. Um, so that's really essentially what this paper is, is just suggesting a new way forward um, for your consideration. Thanks very much, Saskia. I'll actually um, take the opportunity to speak on this first. The affordable housing situation in central Otago, as it was, and for all we know, maybe, we simply don't know, has been a, a major um, part of my uh, role as mayor. Um, having said that, I am in support of this um, way forward because obviously COVID-19 has changed everything. It may have changed our housing market. Um, we simply don't know. And so I think um, parking that side of it for an updated market analysis next year, once some of the implications have come through um, and then start, not starting afresh, but making decisions then, if we have to make them based on that market analysis is the only sensible way forward. But certainly the work that's been done in the background um, in terms of the incentivisation and density options, um, I believe should be progressed because they'll, number one, take a while anyway, but number two, will hold us in good stead no matter which way the market goes. And I think that um, the part that we may yet get to look at of where we play in terms of use of utilising housing as part of the recovery is also crucial. So I'm just generally speaking in support. Uh, that may come as a surprise to some people, but I think that we really, everything has changed and we need to just pause for breath and see what happens next um, in, in all aspects of our economy. Um, but I'm open, uh, open the floor now for people. Um, if they wish to let me know that they want to speak. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm well, well, right here, Tim, so I haven't have time to type. I'm right. happy to, to move A, B, C, D, and E. I don't, Neil, I think you were wanting to comment. No, it's right, done. 
Okay. Um, any further comments, councillors? Tame is happy to second. So Nigel's moved. Tame is second. I'll see if there's any other um, anyone else wishes to comment on that. No. In that case, thank you. I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. All those against? That's carried. Thank you very much, Saskia, for the work. It's been a major amount of work in the background there, and Nigel and I attended a meeting on it, uh, a workshop on it, and um, it's, it is somewhat frustrating to be in this point, but it's the least of our worries, frankly, with COVID, so um, I think that's sensible. Righty ho. Um, page 529, the proposal on the ORC's Plan Change 7. And um, Nick, are you with us? Yes, I am, Tom. Good Hi. afternoon, everyone. Great to hear your cheerful voice. I'll let you take us through the report. You can take it as read, obviously, though. Yeah, I think I'll take it as read. Happy to answer any questions. Um, very appreciative of uh, the feedback that was given on the draft that was circulated uh, to councillors. Um, and uh, I guess the process from here is we've asked for the uh, to be able to speak for the report, uh, to the submission, and we're awaiting a date um, from the Environment Court for that. Um, happy to answer any questions on it, though. Um, yeah, so please ask away. Any questions, Council? At the end of the day, this is a formality, but uh, it might just be more a discussion. Um, it's already gone up. We've, we've um, been caught in the time trap, but anyone have any comments to make? Yeah, Your Worship, Neil here. Um, yeah, I think um, a very good submission. Thank you, um, Nick. Um, it, it's um, some, some challenging times and the whole issue around Plan Chase 7 is going to be interesting going forward. So I think um, you put things rather succinctly and um, I guess we'll probably get a second crack anyway, won't we, with, um, with when it goes to the EPA? Yes, absolutely. So we've requested that we will um, like to speak to it as well. And hopefully that um, that hearing should be in Alexandra. And it reminds me, I need to write a letter to emphasise that to the EPA, because there's no absolutely no way that it should be anywhere other than in Alexandra, unless it were in Omacow. And other than that, if it's in Dunedin or Queenstown or somewhere like that, um, we need to get in first and kick up Bob's you die. Right, anybody else? Um, Everyone seems pretty happy with where we're at with this. It's a, it's a significant um, thing that we're doing. Um, this is this council and the last council, I think, were the first to really start to get into um, taking on um, challenges such as this. And uh, I don't think there's many in our community we're not speaking for and saying, I think everyone's got concerns with Plan Change 7. But look, um, nobody else is, is indicating they wish to comment in particular. So I'll move A and B if somebody would second that. Yeah, I will. Thank you, Neil. Any further discussion? And that's passed. Nick, that was an exceptionally good bit of work. And again, done at a time when you were not only um, dealing with the business <laughs> with the what the hell's going on with COVID um, and with trying to do your do your job from home and everything else, um, uh, but you were also on the EOC and having a part to play in that. So it was exceptional that you got that done to such a high quality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Yes, thank you. OK, this takes us on to our fraud, bribery and um, corruption policy. Um, just seeing whose um, report this is. It's Gabby's. Thank you. Hello, Gabby. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Today I'm presenting the fraud, bribery and corruption policy and process and the protected disclosure Closures whistleblower policy. I'm taking the report as being read. Uh, these two policies and process were presented at the 28th of February 2020 audit and risk meeting, and they were consequently recommended to Council for adoption, pending a few minor changes which have been completed, and these can be seen throughout the documents in blue. Now, fraud is quite a topical subject at the current time. And despite New Zealand's generally clean image, fraud is simply becoming a fact of business life in New Zealand due to a number of factors. Fortunately, this council has a great track record in terms of lack of wrongdoing and corruption instances, and we really want to ensure that it stays this way. So the right controls and culture for detecting and reporting instances of wrongdoing within the organisation are in place, I'm pleased to say, and these three documents aim to support this. 
The documents cover the foundations for the management of instances of wrongdoing, providing accountability and a robust structure for the management of an event in the instance that it occurs. So these documents, combined with regular and tailored training and audits, certainly minimise both the opportunity and the temptation for fraud to be committed. It's actually been proven that fraud is much less likely to occur when people know that the likelihood of being caught is high, and I would like to think that these documents aim to set the foundation for this. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions, councillors? Yeah, I just had a question, Shirley here. Um, on page 546, I think it was, they talk about um, fraud as being some sort of gain. And I wondered if it's just always gain. Actually, it might be 457. Um, is, is it possible that people would, could get up to mischief to not, not for their own gain, but to um, put the council into disrepute or something like that? Um, I would like to think that this policy covers that. But overall, fraud is essentially for their own gain. That is yeah. the definition. Yeah. Okay, I it just occurred to me that yeah, it might be something that might have been missing. Yeah. Any other questions of Gabby, councillors? Okay. Well, it's very uh, it's very comprehensive, Gabby. Thank you for that. Um, and so um, I guess I'll just well, I hear a voice. I'm quite prepared to move the recommendations, Your Worship, Martin. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. Would somebody second those? Yes, Stu, here, I'll do that. Thank you, Stu. Any further discussion, councillors? In that case, I'll um, put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Uh, and against? Thank you. And Gabby, as I've said to several um, speakers today, you also were operating in the EOC while getting this work put together. Um, so I greatly appreciate uh, the quality of the work and having it behind us, not in front of us now. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Righty ho, 558. Gosh, that's getting very close to 566, isn't it? Jotham, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Jotham here. Here to take us through the financial report, please. Yes. Um, taking the report as read, I would like to highlight three items and I'm happy to take questions at the end. The first one I would like to highlight is um, the revised budget. The revised budget is based on a reforecast that staff staff did in February. Uh, these budgets have been based have been phased based on staff's most up to date information. So we do this uh, rephrasing twice a year. We did one in August and we've done another one in February. And in August we did bring you a revised budget which um, the council approved. Uh, but in February, when staff uh, revised their budgets, there were no changes to the overall um, surplus that we had agreed on. So we didn't we did need to bring it to council to approve. So um, I will say that this was done before the impact of COVID-19. So the variances you see next month might vary drastically just because um, this budget was phased based on the information we had at the time, but has changed since um, the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, another item I'd like to highlight is under assets found, which is uh, the Central Stories building. So this building was not included when um, in the property list that was given to QV at the end of uh, June 2019. And we and we did not pick it up when we're doing our reconciliation. But during this month's reconciliation, while we're looking at the capital expenditure, we noticed that Central Stories had capital expenditure. However, we did not have the building in our asset list. So we requested a valuation from QV and have added the building into our asset list. The third item I'd like to highlight is um, the council's capital expenditure program, which currently sits at 17 million, which is 44% um, of the overall budget. So it's a bit low, but we hope to carry most of this work forward into the next financial year, 2020, 2021. 
I'm, uh, I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you, Jotham. Questions for Jotham, councillors? Oh, I think they're letting you off lightly. <laughs> I think, I think to be fair is that because it's unfortunately and it's not a reflection on anybody here it's 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 out of date and not current and um the, the next meeting i think will be quite a different conversation yeah it is yes. what it is at the moment yeah mm -hmm. all right okay i'm not hearing from anybody else so um, i'm quite happy to move that we receive the report if somebody would second that I will. Thank you, Neil. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Carried. And now, Jotham, you're, you. yes. you're in an expectant state, am I correct? Or your family is? Yes, my wife is 11 days away from her due date, so uh, we're, we're pretty much hoping something happens sooner rather than later, but yes. Well, look, all the very best wishes from all of us down here. I know you're, you're at home and, and you're in Wellington. Um, yes. uh, all the very best wishes to you and your wife and your, your new little one. And we look forward to hearing the good news and seeing the beautiful pictures. All right. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you, thank you councillors. Cheerio. Right. That brings me to my report. And um, really, so much of it has covered what's been said in the conversations today. Um, just the impact of COVID-19, there's no use to um, going over it again um, because, well, we've all lived it, haven't we? Um, but I do just want to emphasise, as I have again today, the work of council staff through all of this. Um, it has been absolutely exemplary from the top down. Um, we've had people going through what we've all gone through and what the whole community's gone through um, but also doing the EOC role, and I was sitting in the EOC meetings um, and saw what that involved, uh, particularly in the early stages, a huge amount um, of work in a, in a situation that was really unknown. Um, all the training that I've done as mayor for a civil defence emergency, I don't think once talked about a pandemic. Um, it was not something that the whole country, I think the whole world indeed, um, took seriously enough, and boy, have we learned the lesson. But the way that our community um, and the way that our council and our council staff and our community board members, our councillors, everyone has um, reacted and behaved through this has made me immensely proud and grateful to be the Mayor of Central Otago at a time of absolute extreme um, difficulty for the community. And um, it's our job now, and I think we've made a very good start on it today to um, lead the community through the economic impacts um, of what of what COVID has caused. The, uh, I think it's really important to say that the, the lockdown hasn't caused the economic impacts. The primary economic impact is uh, the, the inability of our trading partners to buy things and people to fly into New Zealand and fly out of New Zealand. Um, the effects of the lockdown would have happened whether we had the lockdown or not because you can't have the impact on your health system, as we've seen in other countries, without your economy collapsing as well. So we're in a better position than most, and blessedly and gratefully, um, with no um, no losses of lives in our district. So um, I won't go on. I'm potentially get emotional if I do. So um, I'll move my report. If somebody would second that. I will. Your Worship. Very much, Neil. All those in favour? Aye. And against. Uh, nobody. Well, that's good. And um, that remains the date of the next scheduled meeting is Wednesday 3rd of June, where we will adopt our annual plan. Um, and Rebecca, just remind me, do we have to go back into close to deal with anything or are we done? We're done. Thank you. I just saw another, um, I, I had a note from before that was in the wrong place. Okay, we're done. Councillors, thank you very much. That was um, remarkable, I think. Uh, the way we got through that, there was some really good engagement, really good um, discussion, um, and it was an absolute privilege to chair that meeting um, and get through the work that we did. And I'm walking out of here feeling a very grateful mayor for the council that I have. And to the staff, um, I think I've expressed to everyone in, a, um, in individual manners, but to uh, everyone who's participated today and the staff, 
uh, deepest gratitude, Rebecca and Pam, for making sure that the gears in the back worked. Um, the ET team, Sancha especially, uh, putting everything together, that, that has been really quite remarkable. Um, thank you very much for your work today. And even though it's Monday, I suggest we all have a glass of something um, this evening. Might have be out on Facebook Live though, because I've got that at seven o'clock. <laughs> Just say a huge thank you to you, Tim, because it must have been exhausting chairing that meeting today. Thanks very much. I'll get um, I'll get uh, councillors just to remain. We're going to drop off live. I just want to touch base on a couple of things. Um, but if you could just remain, don't hang up. Thank you. And thank you too to the uh, media and to anyone who may have joined us today. We can't see whether you're there or not. So, um, but if you were, um, greatly appreciated. Thank you. All right, ending live now. Thank you. Alrighty, we're off live.